This meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Here. Mrs. Cons? Here. Mr. Lavalley? Here. Mr. Salt? Here. Mr. Temby? Here. I will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Matson Bonet, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Are there any items to be added to the agenda? And uh, let's please consider moving item 9A, ENDS 1.1 monitoring report prior to public comments, and then move 11A, the 2023-2024 new course proposals from Pine Creek High School and the Village High School prior to item 10A, which is the EL 2.4 monitoring report. May we have a motion to approve the agenda with those modifications? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? <clears throat> Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalli? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Timby? Aye. I want to read an, uh, a letter, an email that Mr. Gregory and I both sent to the staff of Academy District 20. Um, a, it was a couple weeks ago, I think, but I think it's still uh, very important to read. Good afternoon, Academy District 20 staff. What was supposed to be a hopeful week of giving thanks has turned to tragedy. An act of violence at a haven for our LGBTQ plus community members claimed five lives and spread fear, sadness, and pain throughout our region and frankly, our nation. On behalf of the Academy 20 District Board of Education and Administration, we offer our deepest condolences to the families and friends of those lost or injured. We also offer our full support to staff who are struggling because of this horrific event. If you are hurting and need assistance, please access your EAP services or reach out to a trusted family member, friend, or colleague. If there are other ways our district can offer assistance and support, please do not hesitate to let us know. We recognize words alone cannot cure the pain and heartbreak we are experiencing, and words alone cannot put an end to such tragic acts. While we alone cannot, quote, fix this divide in our society, we can each start by putting people first, all people. For nearly three years, we have worked on a strategic plan that puts people first and places the highest value on belonging. We are committed to living these words. They are not just words on paper. We therefore condemn this terrible act of violence. We will not stand for hatred or discrimination in our schools or our community. In Academy District 20, we continue to strive to ensure all people are safe, accepted, and feel a true sense of belonging. Moving forward, we will engage in the work that pushes past our differences, judgments, and assumptions, and assures all people have dignity, respect, and are fully appreciated. As you give thanks this week, please be mindful of how we treat and interact with one another. With heavy hearts, myself and Mr. Gregory. In light of this horrific tragedy, let us take a moment of silence to respect the innocent lives that were wrongfully taken before their time. Thank you. The board highlight is uh, a little bit different. Normally we have a board quote and it was Ms. Cloninger's suggestion and I we all agreed that it was a good idea. The first board meeting of every month, and in, in this case December is the only board meeting, instead of doing a board quote, we're going to do a highlight. And the, the, the hope, in fact I have a little thing I want to read. Um, well, I already started. Um, this, uh, so we all agreed it was a good idea to do a basically a a uh, a highlight to a district employee or a student um, who has just done some great things. It is simply to highlight someone from our district who goes above and beyond. To be sure, there are many who are deserving of this. We are only doing one a month, but I think it's a great way to honor and thank just a few of our great people. I asked Ms. Cloninger to allow me to do tonight because the individual I wanted to highlight was going to be here anyways. And that person is Jonathan Bluff. Jonathan, would you please stand to be recognized? <laughs> Jonathan is a high school teacher at Discovery Canyon campus. I had the pleasure of meeting him, I think last year or the year before. Um, when you walk into his classroom, it's obvious he is passionate about teaching and passionate about aviation. 
He cares deeply about his students and wants to see them succeed. He teaches introduction to engineering design, aerospace engineering, digital electronics, and in the future, he is going to be teaching uh, technically SUAS uh, licensing course, which in fact, I call it a drone course, and I hope that's accurate. Um, it's a drone course. He is a constant learner and achiever, but also someone who enjoys creating positive relationships with his students to help them achieve. He hopes to launch a rocket uh, in the next two months by 10,000 feet above ground level. He hopes to get it supersonic, which is pretty awesome. And I hope to attend if I can. I think it's down in Pueblo. Am I right? It'll be in Pueblo, yeah. And, yeah. 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 Typical deferring to his students. But uh, Jonathan is just a, a great teacher, a great example of, of just the great quality people we have in D20. Um, Jonathan, thank you for your tireless efforts on behalf of all of our great students at DCC. Next is item, item 9A, which we moved, ends 1.1 monitoring report. Mr. Gregory. Yes, Dr. Field, please. Good evening, can you all hear me okay? Great, so it's my pleasure this evening to present the annual monitoring report for E1.1. And this evening it'll be myself, Mrs. Patterson, our Director for Assessment, Dr. Pariso, our Director for College and Careers, and Ms. Shelley Kuzer over here, our um, Chief Information Officer. So the report reflects the board's charge of monitoring the global end statement that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. So our teachers, principals, and our learning services team continue to work extremely hard and focus on growth and achievement of all students in all content areas by meeting or exceeding Colorado ac academic standards. As you know, we are very proud of the fact that we have been accredited with distinction for the 14th year in a row. And now Ms. Patterson's gonna kick us off. So tonight we will share um, highlights and information from the E11 report, including methodology and interpretation of the indicators, as well as Dr. Field shared Dr. Field, Mrs. Kuzer, and Dr. Pariso will be sharing additional information as we walk through this report. Is the microphone working for everyone? Because I'm not very tall. Okay. Um, as we walk through this report, we will provide page numbers for each section so you can easily follow along. Before we move to the report, I want to share information regarding the district performance framework. So you'll remember this year they were released a little bit late, so we haven't spent as much time together talking about it. So I wanted to make sure we, um, so that's what I left for, thank you, sir, for each of you um, at your seats tonight as well. So tonight I provided each of you with a copy of the 2022 DPF or district performance framework. Historically, the district and our schools receive a framework yearly from the Colorado Department of Education. During the COVID pandemic, the DPF was frozen from 2019 to 2021. Fall of this school year, 2022, frameworks were once again provided to the district and each of our schools. During our E11 report tonight, we will res reference the district's performance on the district performance framework or DPF, which is developed from CMAS, PSAT, SAT, and post-secondary workforce readiness criteria. The three performance indicators that are used for ratings are academic achievement, academic growth, and post-secondary workforce readiness. Information regarding cut points and scoring for the DPF can be found on Appendix A of this report. So a couple more things to keep in mind. At the elementary level and the middle school level, growth accounts for 60% of the scoring mechanism and achievement accounts for 40%. At the high school level, achievement is worth 30% of the scores, growth 40%, and then post-secondary workforce readiness, or fondly referred to as PWR, um, is 30%. In 2022, we have to remember that growth data was limited due to the prior year when we um, when we did, the state did, every other grade level and every other content area of testing. And that is noted in the, um, the notes on the DPF as well. So map growth was implemented as a new benchmarking tool fall of 2020. 
As we go through this report, it's important to note that MAP growth, so remember we added MAP growth during the pandemic when we didn't have DPFs, those kinds of things. But MAP growth and CMAS are assessing really two different things. MAP growth assessment is aligned to the Colorado academic standards, and it really provides teachers with students instructional level. What are students ready to learn next? CMAS is slightly different because it provides us with performance levels, identifying what grade level standards students have mastered. MAP growth has additionally provided us with a linking study, and we've spent a lot of time this year with our principals during our principal, um, principal data cycles looking at this linking study with predictive data that shares with us how students will perform on CMAS, PSAT, SAT in the future. And we've really seen that it is very consistent. It really is an indicator. So now we will begin with the report on page two. ENDS 1.1 Knowledge and Skills, reasonable progress for this indicator is accomplished by meeting at least eight of the 10 indicators. I will begin with the first indicator. This indicator is measured by the overall rating of the district performance framework. The standard or expectation for meeting this indicator is the same as the state expectation of accredited or accredited with distinction. Academy District 20 was accredited with distinction, so the standard for Indicator 1 was met. Indicator 2, Academic Achievement, measures how students performed on the assessment in the given year. The district met the Colorado, Colorado expectations for academic achievement. Indicator 3, Academic Growth, measures how individual students performed from 2021 to 2022. The district met the Colorado expectations for academic growth. We are now going to move to page three. Indicator four, post-secondary workforce readiness measures SAT scores, dropout rates, matriculation rates, and graduation rates for high school students. The district met the Colorado expectations for post-secondary workforce readiness. Indicator five, achievement in ELA and math. Successful progress toward academic achievement in grades three through 11 are indicated by CMAS, PSAT, SAT, and additionally MAP growth performance results, meets or exceeds, in English language arts and math. You will notice this year science scores are not provided from CDE as this was the first year students were tested on the new 2020 standards. And so we will see that appear again in the future. The district met the standard for the indicator. We are now moving to page four. Indicator six, growth in math and ELA. Success, successful progress toward annual growth at the elementary, middle, and high school levels are indicated by CMAS, PSAT, SAT, and MAP growth performance results of meets or exceeds in English language arts and math. The district met the standard for the indicator. Moving to page six. Indicator seven. Successful preparation for high school graduation and college is indicated by the Colorado SAT mean scale score as determined by the district performance framework or the DPF. The district met the standard for the indicator. Indicator eight, success is indicated by graduation rates measured by the DPF. Note that the most recent data available is for the previous school year, the 2021 graduates. Based on the standards below, the result meets the standard for the indicator. Next, Dr. Parasol will be sharing information regarding college and career readiness in indicators nine and 10, and he will be working off of page seven. Thank you, great being with you guys here this evening. Um, the first indicator nine is the ICAP, which is an individual career and academic plan. Uh, this is a multi-year process that intentionally guides students and families in the exploration of career, academic, and post-secondary opportunities. With the support of adults, students develop the awareness, knowledge, attitudes, and skills to create their own meaningful and powerful pathway toward post-secondary and workforce readiness. The state of Colorado requires ICAP for grades nine through 12. District 20 offers a robust ICAP program that goes beyond the required grade levels beginning in the sixth grade. In compliance with state requirements, students are given opportunities to participate in and track progress on the following through District 20's ICAP program. Interest surveys focusing on career and college exploration, established written post-secondary and workforce SMART goals, which are specific, measurable, obtainable, relevant, and timely, intermediate benchmarks, and data reflecting progress toward established goals, 
activities that establish connections between school-based instruction and the world of work, an intentional planning of students' sequencing of courses and programs that reflect progress toward their post-secondary goals, college applications, resume development, and alternative work-based applications, an understanding of financial literacy of life after high school. District 20 schools primarily use the Naviance College and Career Readiness Platform to both deliver and manage students' ICAP work. Indicator, indica, indicator 9's goals is to have 95% or greater of students actively engaged in the ICAP process. The middle school in grades 6 through 8 did meet our goal with 96%, 95%, and 99% respectively for those grade areas. Um, Regarding the high school grade levels, they also met the goal with the 98% for freshmen, 96% sophomore, 96% junior, and 95% for seniors across those grade levels. Indicator 10, in addition to key academic indicators as mentioned previously in this report, and in alignment with the student's ICAP process, students who are college and career ready upon graduation are those who also have developed technical skills, 21st century employability and leadership skills, and have had relevant real world experiences. In alignment with state and federal frameworks, this indicator consists of multiple pertinent measures which give a snapshot of graduating seniors who are college and career ready beyond meeting graduation requirements only. This data represents the 2022 graduated senior class, which consists of 1,868 students. The first portion of this indicator is career technical education pathways the per these are the percentage of graduating seniors who have completed a sequence at least two years or equivalent of concentrator and completion status of courses within career and technical education pathways or programs. So this year um, we were at 57.5%, which remains relatively consistent. We had a slight dip from the previous year's graduating class was at 60.2. And we equate this to last year's graduating seniors having been basically in the in the, in the middle of that whole COVID issues. Those graduating seniors last year had quite an experience over their four years. The next one is the work-based learning experience. This is the percentage of graduated seniors who have successfully completed a work-based learning experience as defined by the Colorado Department of Education's work-based learning continuum, which are such things as clinical experiences, credit for work, internship, pre-apprenticeships, industry-sponsored projects, supervised entrepreneurial experiences, apprenticeships, and on the job training. Uh, this year we're at 10.4%, which was an increase from 7.9% the previous year. The next is industry certifications. This is the percentage of graduated seniors who have earned an industry or business recognized certification or credential as listed on the Colorado Department of Higher Education list and the Career Development Incentive Program. This year, we, or this last graduating class was at 4.8%, which is an increase from 3.7% the year before. College credit, the percentage of graduated seniors who have successfully taken at least one college course earning a C minus or higher. Uh, that was also an increase over last year's 21.2% at 24.9%. AP and IB tests, this is the percentage of graduated seniors who have scored at least a three or higher on at least one advanced placement test and or those graduating students who have scored at least a four or higher um, on at least one international baccalaureate IB test. And I have an appendix, appendices in C kind of gives an outline of the different score possibilities for those two different programs. This remained relatively consistent. Um, this year at 38.8% and last year was at 38.9. So I was pretty flat and pretty consistent. The outcomes noted in this data are intertwined with students' ICAP goals. And as we refine our ICAP program and systems around these five measures, students and parents will further engage and take advantage of these opportunities afforded to them. And so our statement of reasonable progress, uh, we report that 10 out of 10 indicators meet the standard, and so the end achieved as interpreted. Now I'd like to turn uh, the presentation over to Ms. Kuzer, who will lead us through E1.1.1, three ones. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pariso. So please continue to page nine. E1.1.1 was changed in 2021 to align students' proficiencies of tools, techniques, and technologies with the continued implementation of the district's digital resource philosophy, which reads, 
Digital resources should be used to enrich learning, promote student achievement, and advance students towards deep, authentic learning in a healthy, balanced, and safe digital environment that is representative of the ever-changing digitized modern world. In the electronic board packet, there is a link where you can read the entire philosophy statement as well as the belief statements. The first indicator is measured by ensuring all students have access to digital tools to support their learning. The 21-22 school year served as the baseline year and the district, as the district implemented a one-to-one -one district provided device program for grades three through 12 and a three to one device ratio for K through two. The district has made significant investments in digital devices starting in 2020. These investments as indicated in graph one show that each student grades three through 12 have access to Windows, a Windows laptop. The device count is greater than the student count to allow for flexibility in student enrollment as well as device repairs. Graph two on page 10 depicts kindergarten through second grade iPad to student ratio data. During the 2019 <coughs> replenishment program evaluation, input from principals was gathered and a decision to provide a three to one ratio for K through two was recommended by the elementary principals. The current ratio continues to be higher than three to one due to the remaining iPad leases, which we had for Mountain View Elementary fifth grade, Challenger Middle School, as well as Pine Creek High School. These schools and grade levels moved to a Windows device fall of 2021. This is the final year of the lease, so 625 iPads will be retired and removed from the network June 2023. The number of devices that will still remain above the district provided three to one ratio due to building, buildings being, you know, they're purchasing their own iPads. Some schools have chosen to purchase iPads to lower the ratio to a two to one or even a one to one in some cases. Based upon the data in graph one and two, the result meets the standard for indicator one. Instructional time has increased because students have a device readily available throughout the school day. This eliminated the time it takes to move students from the classroom to a computer lab or even getting devices from laptop carts. Students who, choose to bring, students who chose to bring their own device this year through the BYOD program um, is actually on the decline. This year, there were about 250 parents that applied for the BYOD waiver. Parents are realizing that the benefit of having that fully functional device at the cost of $25 a semester is beneficial. And teachers are also, they prefer that students use the district provided device because it lessens the troubleshooting time during instructional time. The second indicator ensures that students will have access, that all students will have access to district provided tools and technology. Schoology and Microsoft Teams were available to all district stakeholders in 2018. The adoption rate by schools varied until March of 2020. And to ensure best practices for student outcomes, professional learning opportunities were offered. And Appendix D on page 22 lists all those professional learning opportunities that we've offered the staff from the 21-22 school year. Now, these courses really are focusing on the best practices for additional tools that are used to integrate with the Schoology and the Teams platform. Moving back to page 10, graph three re represents the unique Schoology logins for staff, students, and parents. As you can see, the trend, which rose significantly during the fourth quarter of 1920, remains consistent at about 20,000 logons each quarter. The logon trend is indicative that Schoology is being utilized consistently regardless of the learning environment. The consistent feedback we continue to receive is that students and parents appreciate having a single application, which facilitates the assignment of workflow with that teacher. Additionally, the Schoology menu grew dramatically this past year due to the demand for integrated applications and curriculum, highlighting the importance of a single sign-on for access as well. Turning to page 11, Graph four notes the utilization of Microsoft Teams. And really, unlike the Schoology trend, Microsoft Teams did fluctuate depending upon those learning environments. Um, with a return to in-person learning fall of 2021, Microsoft Teams was used at a rate one and a half times compared to the pre-pandemic rate. Um, additionally, February of 2022, you'll see a spike there. There was an increase because of the e-learning days. Um, due to the district being closed for inclement weather. So it's obviously being used when it's needed. 
Um, this fall, the usage um, continued to be relatively flat due to students being back in person. The district and schools really, they still are continuing to utilize Microsoft Teams in, to host you know, virtual meetings, parent teacher conferences, parent academies, as well as board meetings, just to name a few. These tools have enhanced the learning environment and the communication in our ever-changing digitized modern world. So the statement for reasonable progress for the E1.1.1, two of the two indicators meet the standards and align with the district digital resource philosophy's third belief statement, which reads, we believe safe, fair, and equitable access to digital resources is paramount and that technology and digital resources should be supported by appropriate investment in equipment and infrastructure to ensure equitable access to current tools and resources for all and provide robust provide a robust suite of appropriate digital resources to support timely access to learning. As a result, the end is achieved as interpreted. Now I would like to turn it over to Mrs. Patterson to continue with E1.1.2. Okay, we are going to continue on to page 12 for E1. There's a lot of letters and numbers tonight. E1.1.2 policy provision statement states that students will be proficient in critical and innovative thinking. Reasonable progress is accomplished by meeting the indicator. Indicator 1, proficiency in critical thinking in grades 3 through 11 is indicated by the applicable CMAS ELA standards at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. The standard applicable to critical thinking is CMAS English Language Arts Standard 4 focused on research and reasoning. For CMAS, district students will meet or exceed state expectation cut points as reported on the district performance framework and map growth students will meet or exceed in English language arts. Please refer to Appendix E on page 24 of this report, which provides additional evidence and information of activities and clubs that are being offered at our various schools across the district. The statement of reasonable progress, the district met the indicator, therefore the end is achieved in, as interpreted. Dr. Field will now share an illustration of critical and innovative thinking from one of our schools. Okay, so the example that I'm going to share tonight is from, <clears throat> excuse me, an eighth grade science class at Timberview Middle School. And this is a forces in motion unit where students address um, a lot of different learning targets to, to a project called mouse trap cars. So the standards that students are addressing in this assignment is that they will apply Newton's three laws of motion to design a solution to a problem involving the motion of two colliding objects. They plan an investigation to provide evidence that the change in the object's motion depends on the sum, sum of forces acting on the object and the mass of the object. And finally, construct and analyze data to describe the relationships between variables. So during this unit, which occurs over several weeks, students learn about forces and motion, and then they get to create and construct a car that has a mousetrap engine. So students compete with their mousetrap cars to win in several different categories. Some of those categories include the longest run, the fastest car, etc. Students apply what they have learned about to design a car and build a lab. Students in groups test different construction methods and their impact on the car function. Teams are able to make adjustments to their mousetrap cars and identify the forces that positively and negatively contribute to the motion of the car. Classes compete with one another. The winning cars in each area get suggestions from the learning of the rest of the class. All of the eighth grade comes together to have a winner's competition and at the conclusion of the lab, the forces on the car and the motion of the car are analyzed. So students are able to apply their skills and engage in critical thinking and problem solving to design, build, and test a product with an intended purpose. Students and teams make revisions, think critically, and compete. This is a very popular project. It's been going on for a long time. So we 
I don't know if we've moved to page 14 or if we were on page 14, but we're going to be on page 14 now. So policy provision statement E1.1.3 states that students will be proficient in problem solving. Reasonable progress is accomplished by meeting one of the one indicator below. Indicator one, proficiency in problem solving in grades three through 11 is indicated by applicable CMAS math standards at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. The result meets the standard for the indicator. Dr. Field's going to come back now and share another story with us around problem solving at several of our schools. So has anybody ever heard of Minecraft? Uh-huh. Right. Okay, so this is, a, this is my example I want to share with you. It actually spans elementary to high school. And I know, might know a few college students who still play Minecraft. But students explore critical thinking and problem solving through a limitless creative canvas in Minecraft Education Edition. So for example, at Academy Endeavor, after studying Colorado's ancestral Pueblans, fourth grade students recreate the cliff dwellings similar to Mesa Verde to demonstrate how this cultural group was, has affected the development of the region. At Antelope Trails Elementary, Minecraft is built into an inquiry lab for third, fourth, and fifth grade students that is tied to curriculum as an ongoing activity throughout the year. At Legacy Peak Elementary, students use their knowledge of government and geometry to design a functional city. Combining Minecraft and virtual reality technology, fifth grade students at the Da Vinci Academy create ecosystems and then use the district's virtual reality headsets to explore each other's creation, posing and answering questions about how various species interact. At Discovery Canyon Middle School, seventh graders will be building biomes and science to demonstrate their understanding. And at Pine Creek High School, students util utilize Minecraft and English to apply critical analysis of setting as an integral part of literature. And they use Minecraft worlds and science classes to present solutions to real world environmental problems while developing scientific literacy and sustainability practices. These schools are proving that Minecraft is much more than just a game. It is a powerful tool that incorporates creation, problem solving, critical thinking, and even coding. Continuing on page 16, policy, policy provision statement E1.1.4 states that students will be proficient in appropriate, creative, and effective communication. Indicator one, proficiency in appropriate, creative, and effective communication in grades three through 11 is indicated by CMAS English language arts standards at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels. The standards applicable to the appropriate, appropriate creative and effective communication include English language arts standards two and three. Based on the standards of the result, the result meets the standard for the indicator. Page 17, indicator two, Proficiency in appropriate creative and effective communications in grades three through 11, indicated by um, CMAS standard, math standards at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Based on the standards, the result meets the, indica meets the standard for the indicator. Again, looking at Appendix E with our co-curricular activities that are represented to provide evidence of student activities being offered across um, the district. The statement of reasonable progress, two out of two indicators meet the standards, so the end is achieved interpreted, as interpreted. And Dr. Field has one more story for us. Almost done. Okay, so this, sto this story comes from the Biomedical Innovations Capstone class um, at Discovery Canyon High School. So Biomedical Innovations is an advanced level class with the prerequisites of the other three biomedical science courses. As the capstone, it is a unique format. Essentially, students are taking the skills and knowledge that they have gained from the previous three years and are applying them to seven real-life pro uh, problem-based projects. So this semester, they completed three. These projects focused on both science skills and the soft skills our advisory board has told us students need to, to improve on to be successful in the industry outside of high school. So the project that I'm going to share with you real quickly is about designing a more effective emergency room. So students work in groups to design an innovative emergency department capable of better handling the common problems that plague our hospitals. 
students were required to create a floor plan for their emergency room, introduce at least one new biomedical innovation used for patient care, produce a staffing schedule, and provide treatment plans for multiple patients. They presented their plans to members of the advisory board, answered questions, and received feedback from those industry professionals. That's my example. What an awesome experience for our students. So that concludes our formal presentation of this report. What questions can any of us answer for you? Mr. Mr. Salt. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank you guys. This is incredible. I love hearing about the really exciting and engaging ways that we're, we're doing this. I never, you know, I can see Minecraft in some areas, but talking about it with an ELA perspective was just really fascinating. And so I know uh, Dr. Wallstrom was here earlier and I walked around his class and how they were really engaging their students um, in some really creative ways, specifically in the, the ELA department was just, it was fascinating to hear about that and, and the results that we're seeing right now are just proving that that really engaging techniques are, are working well. So thank you all for the, the time that you put into this presentation and the data, but most of all, uh, making sure that our students are thriving. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tembe, I think you were next. Uh, just a quick comment. I think just this underscores that uh, we are focused on academic excellence in this district mm -hmm. as evidenced by our accreditation for the 14th consecutive year. You know, clearly you can see the speed bumps from the pandemic, but I think mm -hmm. we're emerging better than most looking at this data. Uh, and I applaud our effort to really get some data during the pandemic so that we didn't have a massive chasm in longitudinal data. Right, and I'm, I'm hopeful that the NWEA map growth data is also helpful in addition to the CMAS data. I know last year after we gave this report when we didn't even really have, well actually we didn't have CMAS data last year, yeah. that both of them together is, is powerful. Is that something that you still like? Yeah. I just wanna say thank you. Um, we have two big ends, board ends. Why do we exist? And I, 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 I like to call them even district ends. I know they're technically board ends, but knowledge and skills, E1.1, and characters, E1.2. Tonight is a big deal. We're looking at the knowledge and skills, and I think we have done very well. Are we there yet? Of course not. We'll never be, but I just applaud uh, Dr. Field and, your, and, and everybody um, who, who presented, thank you all. I think we're really doing extremely well. Uh, just a couple things that I was really glad to see. Uh, industry certification went up from 68 children to 90, which I thought was awesome. And, and I'm just wondering how much of that is because of the CTE facility um, at, at Liberty. Do we know? I, I'm guessing a fair number of those came from that? Yeah, a fair number came from that. Also within all of our high schools, um, we really are trying to emphasize um, including any type of industry or certification within their industry sector of their career or CT pathway or program. And so there's been a lot of increase more on the technical end, like uh, with uh, some of the Adobe uh, suite um, mm. with uh, a lot of computer based uh, certifications too. But with our CNA and EMT program at Liberty, that's definitely one where we get certifications from. Uh, the construction program gets certifications and so there's a there's we're trying to really add them into all of our programs as much as possible. Thank you. And I was also very glad to see um, college credit. Those that had at least a college credit went from 21% to 25%, which I thought was great. Um, Ford, anything else? Ms. Cons. Just to reiterate, thank you all for your time and these in depth, and thanks for adding the stories. I think it's oh yeah, I think they help connect. Everyone. What what does That's it mean? That's exactly what it does. Right. So, um, and I know we want our kiddos to just continue having the best setup possible for post, you know, D20 life. Um, and as we all see, that accredited with distinction starts 74%. We're at 76.7 this year. And of the three indicators, achievement growth and the PWR achievement was the lowest of all those percentages. Would you say your focus this year is going to be more on that than the other two or in a different framework? I think we're always focused on growth for sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've talked to you already about our math goal, um, our secondary, I mean, it, it falls in secondary where we have 
only about 52% of our students scoring a 500 on the SAT in the 11th grade math. So our goal is to increase that and then same with reading. And so when the growth goes up, achievement will, go, right. will come along okay. as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Field. Oh, Ms. Cloninger, did you have anything? Forgive me. No, I just am trying to save my voice, but I appreciate everything that you said, and I'm texting Tina when I want to speak. Okay, that's great. And um, Tina, just just knock me, grab me, whatever. When yeah, yeah, because I, I want to make sure she gets her chance. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Ms. Cortez, how many people do we have signed up to speak this evening? This evening, we have 63 individuals signed up to speak. Okay, the board welcomes public comments. In the interest of respecting the time of all who are present, speakers must have signed up to address the board prior to 4 p.m. and they must limit the remarks to two minutes or less. We also ask speakers to address the board and not others in the room. All speakers will be notified of the remaining time via the mounted monitors behind the dais. When the time has ended, the microphone will turn off. Supplemental written materials can be given to security guards who are seated in the hallway outside the boardroom and they will be delivered to the board secretary. Profanity or any disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. We greatly value all comments from the public. However, the board will not respond this evening. And I just want to have, I just want to make a little statement. Um, I re, we, the board received an email a few days ago and I honestly had no idea where this came from or what, what they were talking about. And uh, I, I think some rumors have spread that are I, I just again, I, I just want to make th this was a part of the reply that I said in that email and I said, I think I can safely say that the board has never discussed, would never discuss and in fact would condemn any thought of separating students at schools based on anything except parental choice. In addition, there is no board policy on bathrooms. There has never been such a policy, nor has there been any discussion relating to any sort of a board policy regarding bathrooms. Neither of these two topics has come up at any board meeting or a work session. Our first speaker this evening is Alyssa Drew. Good evening. I am many things, but most importantly, I am the proud parent of a D20 student of character and integrity. Tonight, I'm very pleased to read a letter from one of the authors of, the cha of a challenged book. So without further ado, to the members of the school board of Academy District 20, assembled parents, educators, and residents of Colorado Springs. My name is Alexandra, Alexandra Stryron, and I am the author of Still This Country. I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity today to say a few words in support of access to diverse literature in school libraries generally, and to my book, Still This Country in particular. But I'd like first to express my deep condolences for the losses your community suffered during the recent shooting at Club Q. In the wake of a crime that appears to have been motivated by bias, this feels like a delicate but maybe useful moment to be discussing the merits of a book about social justice. If you've read or even skimmed Still This Country, you know I'm a writer with a strong point of view. My political positions and social affiliations probably don't align with those held by many of you. Some of you may even question whether we share the same values. And while I don't doubt our civic spirited differences, I feel certain that our core principles are more closely aligned than it may look on paper. I say this because we're here together today in one form or another. We're here because we all believe in some big ideas. We believe in the power of education as a force for good. We believe in the fundamental right to speak up for ourselves and for those we care about. We believe in personal liberty. And most importantly, we believe in our children. I'll be followed by two more speakers to finish her letter. The next speaker is Lindsay Lee. To carry on, when I began writing Steal This Country shortly after the 2016 presidential election, the nation was in a state of tremendous upheaval. After decades of relative civility, it seemed the world had suddenly exploded, riven by anger and fear and factionalized battles over several hot button social issues. At the time, my son and daughter were in middle school. More than half a century had passed since the social uprisings of the 1960s when young people led protests against the Vietnam War, racial injustice, and in defense of women's rights. 
For my kids, it was an ancient history. They knew the broad strokes, but few details. It occurred to me that our generation of children could use a primer of youthful courage. They should know that there were American heroes and heroines of the recent and distant past, some not much older than them, who had changed history by standing up, sitting down, speaking out. People like Alexander Hamilton, Claudette Colvin, and Ryan White. I also thought it would be useful for them to have facts and kid-friendly language and about some topics at hand, including immigration, LGBTQ rights, climate change, and racial, racial justice, so that they might understand what all the noise was about and why it mattered so very much. And finally, I wanted to give them a toolbox, the fundamentals of social activism, so that they might have some agency over the world they will soon inherit. Steal This Country tackles several thorny subjects and deals with some hard truths, but ultimately it's a celebration of bravery and kindness and ethical behavior, of can-do spirit and optimism in the face of adversity. These are qualities most of us aspire to in ourselves and encourage our children to cultivate and admire. Our next speaker is Susie Bauer. Hi. I grew up in a family of writers. We didn't go to church much. Instead, we worshiped at the altar of books. Reading in my parents' faith was a path of in, to enlightenment. Exposure to ideas and to experiences, especially those with which di diverged from our own, would make us better people. It would enrich our lives and li lives around of those around us. Because of course, the more we understand our differences, the more we realize how much we are alike. Compassion for other people is almost always rooted in a recognition of our common mirrored frailties. Sometimes I wonder how much violence could be avoided if we could read each other's hearts in the pages of a book. I very much hope your committee will come to feel, as I do, that ideas are much less dangerous than the fear of them, and that you will allow the books up for review to remain in your libraries. Again, thank you very much for your time. Alexandra Styron, author of Steal This Country. Our next speaker is Aaron Stevens. We talk a lot about indoctrination in this room. Some things that can be described as indoctrination are religion, groups that hide facts, disparaging student opinions, or rejecting any idea that any ideas that contradict a certain group's beliefs. If I go to a library story time and a nice lady with gray hair and glasses reads The Gruffalo, I'm not being indoctrinated. If I go to a library story time and a drag queen reads The Gruffalo, I'm not being indoctrinated. If I'm riding in the car with my parent and we have an open discussion about beliefs, I'm not being indoctrinated. If I'm having an open dialogue with a friend about our differences, I'm not being indoctrinated. If I sit around a dinner table and I'm told that being gay is wrong, I am being indoctrinated. Conversely, if I'm told that if I'm gay, I'm going to hell, I'm also being indoctrinated. If I go to church and I'm told that I need to believe in Jesus or I'm going to hell, I'm being indoctrinated. If I go to a synagogue and I'm told that there is no hell if you atone on Yom Kippur, I'm being indoctrinated. If I go to a mosque and I'm told that Muhammad is the messenger of God, I'm being indoctrinated. If I'm sitting in AP government and I'm told that if I don't for, vote for a Democrat, I'm ruining the country, I'm being indoctrinated. If I'm sitting in AP history and I'm told the Holocaust wasn't that bad, I'm being indoctrinated. If I'm told that people should all be seen as having value and worth and that who they are or who they love doesn't matter, I'm being indoctrinated to those beliefs. If I'm told that people who love members of the same gender are wrong or that people who feel they were born in the wrong body are groomers or that people who choose different pronouns are disgusting and strange, I'm being indoctrinated to those beliefs. If I hear hate speech over and over again and believe it, I've been indoctrinated. If I don't listen to people's truths and instead believe only one side, I've been indoctrinated. If I feel comfortable asking for school segregation on any basis, I've been indoctrinated. If I've been indoctrinated to an extreme, I will hate. If I hate, I will spread it. If I spread it, it will grow. If it grows, people will die. That's what happens when people are truly indoctrinated. Our next speaker is, I think it's Angela Givler, but it says Angel. Oh no, sorry. Good evening board. I'm Dr. Angel Givler. I'm a parent of two boys in D20 and a teacher in D11. I am here to speak about real issues in our district. I am tired of standing up here 
to shut down manufactured outrage that is hindering this board's ability to work towards real change. As a teacher, I have witnessed a change in our students since the pandemic started. I am not going to talk about quote learning loss because that is a made up standard by adults that want to profit off of standardized testing. Do kids need a little bit more support academically than in years past? Sure, but mostly because they are struggling with their mental health and not because they have lost the ability to learn. I noticed an increase in ADHD and an inability to stay focused in my classroom. I went to my school counselor and she said this is a common theme from the pandemic. Students didn't have to sustain learning in a classroom for an entire day. They were also on devices a lot more to do school as well as stay entertained so their parents could work. Students have been in fight or flight mode because they have been living in active trauma. They didn't know if they were going to be in school or at home. Would they be sick, their parents, or someone they loved? Students have been focused on survival. Rather than help support students through all these difficult times by providing additional mental health providers in the school, I see an increase in deans in elementary schools that are focused on discipline. So instead of supporting students through an extremely difficult time and helping them feel safe and secure, they are being punished for not properly dealing with the stress of a pandemic. This is harmful to our students and will only have further consequences. As I said, I am a teacher in D11 and a mother. I have been in the classroom for 14 years. I have never seen such poor actions from a board before the current boards were elected across the state. The efforts to discredit public education and encourage vouchers for profit rather than focus on real issues in our schools is shameful. I am running for the D20 school board and when I- Time's up. Our next speaker is Katie Redinger. Hello board, my name is Katie Redinger. I'm a teacher at Village High School and I'm reading a letter um, on behalf of a former student. My name is Ava Smith, she, her, hers, and I'm a 22 year old transgender graduate of ASD 20. I was among the first graduating class of ASD 20's Village High School, although when I graduated, I had not yet come out as transgender and was known by a name I no longer claim. My intention with this letter is not to make a political, religious, or otherwise inappropriate stand when it pertains to public education, but to speak on the topic of LGBTQ plus youth and successful and safe education they deserve. A recent proposal or rather idea pertaining to the segregation of LGBTQ plus students in ASD 20 has been brought to my attention and I'm saddened by this news. Trans folks, queer folks around this country are being vividly and violently excluded from social systems. I wish to ensure that LGBTQ plus youth are allowed to participate in their education, including participation with non LGBTQ plus peers. Initiating support systems that more seamlessly and flawlessly support marginalized students ensures better learning environments for all. When queer students feel safe, they add to the education of others in unseen ways. This must be treated less so as a one and done task and more so as work we do in our everyday lives to ensure our impacts are positive. My plea to you is to show us what inclusive, supportive, truly safe educational environments look like. Set standards as you do so. Continue to be the example of inclusive learning environments and explain how symbiotic learning among a diverse body of peers allows for us to learn from each other with each other in unique ways. Perhaps we will see a decline in the gut-wrenching number of student mental health crises within Academy School District 20 and across this nation. The next speaker will continue the letter. Our next speaker is Cindy Fezgin. As a young transgender woman, I have always been told I must invest in my education to ensure success. I want to invest in my education. I want to invest in the education of others. We must ensure that diversity of bodies, thoughts, cultures, and minds be maintained. And in doing so, we must ensure equal education for all. When you seek to hide, ignore, or segregate any group of marginalized student population, you fail to create safe learning environments. Educators will always hold the key to successful social systems. We must ensure our diverse, professional, and incredibly impactful educators 
have the ability to continue supporting those who are left unsupported or undersupported. The personal relationships and educators build with students, coworkers, and administrators is, in fundament, is fundamentally required to create successful community members and successful educational environments. Our educators are capable of including students without excluding others. Let them do so and let our students hold their educators accountable when needed. Further, I ask that you hold yourselves accountable to messages of equity, inclusion, and safety of LGBTQ plus students in all of your facilities. It is fundamental failure to segregate marginalized students because certain individuals hold personal value over their obligation to serve and protect all students. And as a retired D20 principal, a parent of two D20 alumni, one who is transgender, I want to just say that this district has always been a special place. And it's been a special place because of the people who are here and how they care about each other. And I just trust that this board will continue to do the right thing to protect all students from hate. Our next speaker is Rob Rogers. I'm Rob Rogers. My pronouns are he, him and I'm a resident of the district and I have a junior at Liberty. My question to the board and to the community is when does this end? Politicizing a board of education and leveraging dark money to get so-called conservative school board members elected evidently wasn't the end game. Mask restrictions being lifted wasn't the end game because that just ended with the pandemic. Removing CRT from classrooms evidently wasn't the end game because it was never there in the first place and we've already moved on from that manufactured issue. Should we just have passed the medical advice policy that was desired back in February in spite of the fact that it was legally unsound? Would that have been enough? Should we have had an exorcism or had a shaman do a cleansing of the boardroom to eliminate the evil forces? Now that some have answered the call to action, begun running classrooms and libraries looking for woke agendas, is that enough? Are they finding anything? If we remove the five or six books currently being questioned from school libraries, will that be enough? We force every trans student to out themselves to their parents and their peers to protect cis kids from imaginary bathroom attacks. Is that enough? If we move all the gay kids into their own school, will that be enough or will we have to move all the Jewish kids too? Or maybe all the kids with a 504 or maybe all just all the kids with Democrat parents. Would it, would it end then? We somehow managed to scrub the entirety of the public school system and eliminate this, every single thing that Christopher Rufo or your pastors have told you to be outraged and afraid of. Would that be enough? When are you done? You should really try to figure out the answer to this question because the only thing that you've managed to do so far is hurt kids and let them know just how unsafe they are in this community. I really, really hope that there are no claims tonight that segregating LGBTQ students and staff was just an innocent proposal because we all know that it wasn't. And the fact that it's even being discussed at all is precisely the problem. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hayden Michael. Hello everyone, can you hear me well? Okay, all right, so I'm here tonight to speak on leadership and empowerment in education. And of course I want to address immediately in the wake of uh, the Club Q shooting, Colorado Springs has an opportune moment, especially in the education sector to set the things right. We have the opportunity and we cannot let this slip through our fingers. <clears throat> in regards to education, I also have a history lesson to bring to the table because some of us have forgotten what has happened even within less than 50, 40 years. Ruby Bridges still lives today. The woman who survived integration in Louisiana in 1960. She is still alive today. Are we really going to go back to that lesson and say, oh, let's revisit that? Are we really going to do that to our kids? Are we really going to sit across from here and say, no, it doesn't bother me that it's okay to have separate schools for kids. No, it doesn't bother me. I don't have to make a bathroom for trans or gender expansive kids because it doesn't affect me. But then it will. At some point in your life, it will, whether that be positive or negative. So we have to learn from history here. What do we want to do with that answer within ourselves? 
I also have another question for you, for everybody in this room, whether you be pro or con, however this may fall. I want you to think about the first time somebody in your life that you loved didn't believe in you. Take a moment. What did that do to you? How did it shape the relationship you had with that person, especially if they were a loved one, a parent, guardian, someone you looked up to? This is the time to make change. We can make things better. We must make things better, even in small. We are born leaders, whether that be big or small. I believe that we can do this right. And I'm a proud trans. Our next speaker is Linda Taylor. Good evening, board. I'm a community member, a supporter of Advocates for D20 Kids, and I came here tonight just to thank you and wish you well. The three of you who won your seats in the last election did so in overwhelming fashion, which means the vast majority of District 20 supports and believes in you. Please don't ever lose sight of that fact in the midst of the constant screaming, complaining, accusing, and personal attacks. Despite what's been said in the recent past and may be repeated in the future, none of you are in any way complicit in the recent tragedy in our city. None of you are racist, none of you are sexist, none of you hate gays or anybody else, and all of you care about children and childhood education. That's why you ran. That's why you won. That's why you serve. You weren't hiding it. We know who you were. We knew who you were when we elected you. Please don't let the noisy 5% convince you they speak for the 95%. We support you, we appreciate you, we applaud the job you are doing. I hope you and yours have a very Merry Christmas. Thank you again. Our next speaker is Tim Hoffman. My oldest daughter is this minute preparing to go on stage right now at her Christmas choir concert. Instead of being there, I'm here. She told me this morning on the way to school, Daddy, we have to stand up for things sometimes that we believe in for those who are hurting and being hurt. You can hear me sing anytime, go talk. So I'm here. Barely a couple weeks ago, barely a couple weeks out from a terrible hate crime that brought terror to a specific community that I see targeted over and over and over again right here in this room. People stepped to this mic and spewed nonsensical hatred and lies toward the LGBTQ community without a single thought of the fear, hurt, or danger it can bring to those in that community. I'll stop short of drawing a, drawing a directly influential line from this board to the hatred that erupted at Club Q, but I will postulate this. Your words and actions have allowed a hatred to simmer and grow under the surface, and you are indirectly complicit in the tension, stress, and hate that the city is currently living under. You've helped to normalize hate. When you collude with folks who blatantly lie, some of which you'll hear tonight, and appear to entertain outlandish, stupidly horrific ideas like segregating students to their own schools, you normalize bigotry and hatred. When your sitting president authors a response to a hateful, bias-based violence that runs counter to his own suggestions of storming classrooms to sniff out content he doesn't like, you normalize hypocrisy and hatred. When you gaslight constituents, antagonize and contradict truth, gain strive, inclusion, contravene SEL, and denigrate marginalized communities, you are normalizing wanton behavior and hatred. Stop doing that. In keeping with the Christmas spirit, and in honor of my daughter's concert, let's sing a song. On the 12th day of Christmas, my school board gave to me 12 massive headaches, 11 racist statements, 10 scriptures quoted, 9 unanswered emails, 8 gaslit comments, 7 folks colluding, 6 Lavalley lies, 5 challenged books, 4 salty rebukes, 3 parental rights, 2 censure votes, and some hate wrapped up underneath the tree. A new year is coming, you guys, and you know what that means, right? Resolutions. Now, as a fitness professional, I would very rarely suggest what I'm about to say, but I think you guys, in 2023, more sugar, less salt. Very 
Our next speaker is Catherine Gale. A month ago and a month before that, I opened by reading the policies of ASD 20, which all school board members have sworn to uphold. The mission of Academy School District 20 is to educate and inspire students to thrive. We believe in quality education, that people are the heart of our success and that relationships matter. Academy District 20 is committed to providing a safe, learning and work environment where all members of the school community are treated with dignity and respect. Today, my focus is safety. I'm still waiting for the board to take public action against Derek Wilburn and Church for All Nations for publicizing our principal's names, schools, and political affiliations. I'm still waiting for the board to stop hateful rhetoric for, and fear mongering at the podium. I'm waiting for the board to explain why belonging is critically important for students to be able to thrive and achieve academic excellence and that wasn't a waste of money. Students who do not feel that they are belonging rarely achieve academic excellence. Learning is collaborative. Teachers, administrators, mentors, and peers all play important roles in the quest for knowledge and understanding. In extreme cases, people who feel they don't belong jeopardize their own safety and that of their community. I'm also waiting for ASD 20 to step up and commit like other Colorado school districts have to provide free lunches for our kids. Food security is a form of safety. Hungry children can't learn. Hungry children don't thrive. Relationships matter. How can our children, ASD 20 professionals and our school community feel safe well, you're not accorded with the dignity and respect that board members have sworn to provide. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Gale. Point of order, point of order, point of order. Um, I understand. Yeah, uh, folks, hold on, st stand by. Let's remember, and, and and he's right. We're not supposed to call out other people. Uh 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 uh. I I talk. I talk. We we don't we don't call out other people when you speak. You uh, except for us. You can speak to us, but no, please don't call out anybody else. Now, uh, I'm I'm just saying we don't call out anybody else. Thank you. Yes, don't mention anybody else's name other than the people behind the podium. When I say address, that's what I mean. That's what we mean as a board. Ms. Cortez, who's next? Our next speaker is Michael Gale. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for my two minutes. Uh, my name is Mike Gale. Um, I live in District 20. Um, I, I've got a child at Air Academy High. I am a member of uh, the district's patron council. I'm a past instructor at the Air Force Academy. I'm a past Marine Corps officer. Um, I have been in harm's way. I believe deeply in this country and its values, not more than anyone else in this room or in the hallway, but uh, as much. So the founding fathers all believe fervently in the importance and integrity of public education that it should reflect the values and the laws of our country. Public education more than anything else is a sine qua non for freedom. It's the absolute bedrock for the survival of our nation and our democracy. The founding fathers expected that we would participate in the political life of our country as fully informed and fully engaged intellectually vigorous citizens. Banning books is not part of this picture.
the suppression of the expression or the identity of any of our neighbors or fellow citizens. Or of anyone who happens to disagree with us or who looks different from us who has a different story. All of that is the language of unfreedom. The language of the inhuman and very anti-American mullahs who just today, Thursday, December the 8th, started executing protesters for democracy, executing them as enemies of God. The mullahs, the mullahs know that their anti-democratic and unfree values cannot stand up against free debate and inquiry. That is exactly what they are afraid of. That is why they and not us are the book banners. Thank you, your time is up. Our next speaker is Lisa Humbarger. Lisa Humbarger. Um, I'm going to be reading a letter on behalf of somebody else. D20 School Board, thank you for the email you sent in support of the LGBTQIA plus community following the tragic Club Q massacre. Your call to put people first, all people, is much appreciated and much needed. I think we can all agree, regardless of where we stand politically, that we would prefer our community to be one that feels safe, treats us with dignity, and nurtures every individual. In that email, you encourage the D20 community to let you know that there are ways our district can offer assistance and support. That is why I'm writing this letter. I'm sorry, long day. During the school board meeting earlier this year, some members of the audience in attendance snickered and made snide comments while D20 LGBTQIA plus students spoke. No one commented on the behavior. The offender was not escorted out of the room. There was no reprimand. There was no reminder about norms. The meeting just went on as if nothing happened, as if that kind of behavior was expected and acceptable, which normalizes such behavior and the attitudes that make it happen both inside and outside the boardroom. If we are truly committed to living the words in your email, to ensuring all people have dignity, respect, and are fully appreciated, there are a few things D20 can do. Establish and maintain clear norms around school board interactions, including demanding that all those in attendance use language that is respectful and sit in a respectful silence while others speak. Issue a public statement in support of literature that shows LGBTQIA plus characters and historical figures in a positive light in our classrooms and libraries. Continue to resist attempts to ban books for the very illegal reason of viewpoint bias. Denou denounce attempts to silence or vilify our LGBTQIA plus students and staff members, including claims of group Sorry, your time's up. Our next speaker is James Gale. No mic test? All right. Before I begin, I'd like you guys to understand what it means to support the LGBTQ. Supporting the LGBTQ is not implying that you are better because of your sexuality. It implies that there is a lot of hate in Colorado Springs, and it is to counteract that hate. Switching topic, a lot of people in, in this room mentioned in previous meetings that we need to protect our daughters because LGBTQ are full with harmful sexual intent. How about we talk about how out of 328 registered sex offenders, 34.5% of them have some title related to the superior in a Christian church, according to Christian today. And I didn't bring that statistic up to be biased against the Christians in Colorado Springs, nor do I think rape should ever be brought up in something like this. However, I brought this up to counteract those who implement sex offenders in the LGBTQ communities. 
in our former meetings. And other touchy subjects of the suicide rates are very high at this point in time, but apparently a lot of parents in this room are unable to act upon it because a lot of suicide rates are involved with homophobic parents against their children. 8.2% of Americans since 2022 are have been a part of the LGBTQ community. And there's been an estimation that the LGBTQ, sorry, LGBTQ teens attempt suicide every 45 seconds. So if you're generally concerned about the children's safety, why are you the problem? And this, the worst part is you guys are not even acknowledging an actual problem. There are students in my school who would like to represent the Confederate flag in our school because they represent, it somehow represents being a rebel. For those who don't know, the Confederate flag was a symbol for the Confederates in the Civil War in the 18th century when America fought for state rights. Those state rights were for Confederates wanting to keep slavery. I imagine some of the people in this room actually fly the flag because they have that same mindset. And to those, let, to those people, let me ask you, would you call me rebellious if I put on a swastika patch? I suppose my to question to Tom Hol Holland, yeah, fuck. Tom, Tom Holland's, or Tom LaValle, sorry and his call are why can't you acknowledge the real problems among the districts instead of only sending thoughts and prayers? Our next speaker is Rhett Saunders. Thank you, board, for uh, your service and thank you for your time. Um, hello, my name is uh, Rhett Saunders and I'm a father of four children in District 20. I'm a supporter of Advocates for D20. As a supporter in, uh, in uh, speaking with many others in the community after the horrific acts on uh, Club Q, I do not know anyone in our community that, feel, that doesn't feel any kind of remorse for the Club Q victims. And this was an awful act perpetrated by an evil person that is now being used appropriately by one side to attack one's political opponents and distract us from the real reason why we're here. And that is my children and D20's commitment to academic excellence. The last two and a half years have been hard on everyone, including the education system through COVID restrictions, quarantines, and I know my children's growth has been impacted. Meanwhile, I am learning that new curriculum reviews are occurring this month and the next. I will be involved to ensure that we are not pu pushing any agenda related ideology that promotes hate for this country or exposes my children to inappropriate material. I am for all people, but these conversations are for parents to discuss with their children and not for the school to dictate or decide. I also please ask for greater transparency around PLC uh, days and what specific topics are pushing agenda driven topics onto teachers. This is not okay, and I ask as a parent to give us greater transparency as parents. I appreciate the board's time and service to this community, and I'll continue to pray for you all to uh, make decisions that are based on your con constituency and the majority of the parents in this county. Thank you. The next speaker is Ann Porter. Good evening, my name is Ann Porter. I am a District 20 parent and a retired special education teacher of 33 years. I came tonight because I heard the rumors and I wanted to see what, what are these people really upset about? As a special education teacher, you can imagine I dealt with a lot of behaviors. One of the resources that I used was uh, Foster Klein in Jim Fay's book, Love and Logic love and logic and what i tried to teach my students is that you are not a victim you are not a victim you have choices to make as we all do and if you make the right choice you're going to have a good result if you make a bad choice it's not going to end so well for you so when i heard that people were feeling that this board was complicit somehow with this terrible tragedy that we all feel awful about, I thought, are you kidding me? The only person that was responsible for that was the person who pulled the trigger. I've, I've come to your school board meetings. I know some of you personally. You are people of character and integrity. We just heard this wonderful report 
about how well after this terrible COVID and this shutdown, you should get, be applauding yourself and the success that you have made up in one year. Uh, could we please, we've had lots of people come uh, talking from the podium tonight about how there have been disrespectful comments during the public speaker um, in past board meetings. And we have had that already tonight. So I'm asking that we all keep side conversations down and be respectful of the person at the podium. Thank you. Both sides have been guilty and I'm asking this to be moving forward consistent that there are no more side conversations during public comment on both sides. May I continue? Thank you, Mr. Salt. Yeah, we gave you a few seconds back. So okay, thank you. Um, where was I? So I was just saying that the only person responsible was the person that pulled that trigger. I have not heard hate speech from this, this um, uh, school board. I think, Mr. Lavalley, what you sent out to the public and to your staff was wonderful. It was heartfelt, it was sincere, and I thank you for that. So I just wanna say, I am here to support you, and it makes me sad that there are people here that are using this event for their own social and political agenda. Our next speaker is Brian Moody. So recent weeks in Colorado Springs have all have been jarring. All of Colorado Springs was shocked, appalled, and horrified by the senseless acts of violence that took place in the Club Q shooting. Everyone feels the effect of mass shootings, but we even more so in this the, since it took place right here in our city. In the days and weeks since the shooting, a narrative has taken place, has taken shape across the nation that's likely and has been repeated here tonight. The responsibility for a killer's actions somehow lie with the people who had nothing to do with it, namely conservatives, advocates for D20 kids, certain board members, and conservatives in general. Tonight, we also hear and, and will continue to hear from speakers who stand at this podium and make such accus accusatory statements. They have turned this board meeting into a regular circus. And if you step back and think, like we have the news media here, we have massive crowd and when I step back and I think about it, this is a school board meeting. You would think this was like a, a professional sports event with the amount of attention that's going on and the passion. I appreciate the passion. My concern is the manufactured controversy that I see happening. Just to make set the record straight, there's another narrative that's unfolding in recent days. The Advocates for D20 Kids is supporting segregation of LGBT students into a separate school. This is completely false. This is a terrible idea and it has nothing to do with the beliefs of our group. So among other things, we've been accused of hate speech and we have never engaged in such hate speech. It's not to say that such hate speech doesn't exist in D20, but we have not participated in that. And I would just really encourage that we get back to the roots of what this is all about, which is academic excellence and successful education for our kids. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Spiller. Our next speaker is Emily Vonagen. In the summer of 2021, a mom whose children attend a private religious school and monument decided to create a local chapter, Moms for Liberty, as a resume filler for future political endeavors. Tonight I speak as a D20 parent who believes that this organization is now too dangerous to ignore. While the chapter states that they are a nonpartisan organization, their actions could categorize them as a well-funded conservative group that has shared a stage with Parents Defending Education, Heritage Foundation, Independence Institute, and 
and CPAN, to name a few. But let's keep it local, shall we? Locally, they align with advocates for D20 Kids, D11 Achievement Alliance, D49 Guard Guardians, Church for All Nations, and Dave Schultheis. The most recent and most concerning relationship, though, is FEC United and UADF, their military security. Now, as a reminder, FEC United was founded by Joel Oldman. Yes, the gentleman who stated that queer people who are teachers should be drugged behind a car till parts of them are falling off, who has called for a mass execution of politicians. So the recent core results regarding the segregation of kids based on their identity is of no surprise, considering that in August of 2022, a reporter interviewed a Moms for Liberty leader, stating that kids with special needs or who identify as queer or trans should be placed in separate special schools. They are recycling conservative talking points and then reinventing their purpose based on the next fabricated outrage. So at some point, members of this board will be invited to speak with Moms of Liberty leadership. And while there are D20 stakeholders who attend to their recent meetings at DCF Gun Shop, Moms, are li Moms for Liberty are not stakeholders in D20. They are an egregious group of citizens who have no ties. And if I was generous in my findings, I would say that the only connection that they have is that the chair is in a relationship with the outgoing HD 14 representative, but I don't believe coitus should be a reason to give someone a platform. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Murray. On this date, 81 years ago, President Roosevelt addressed our nation in response to the attack on Pearl Harbor. He stated that hostilities exist. There's no mincing the fact that our people, our territory, and our interests are in grave danger. Clearly, hostilities exist in D20, and our people are in grave danger. Given the actions and statements about our school district by parents, groups, and board members, I believe that we are nearing the level of propaganda, hype, and demonization of marginalized groups of citizens that in Nazi Germany led to concentration camps, re-education centers, and the atrocities of World War II. This is in direct opposition of our district mission that states that we practice meaningful inclusion, honor diversity, and develop a culture of belonging. The discussion about creating an LGBT transgender school or campus should have been immediately, vehemently, and publicly decried as segregation and being morally repugnant. The constant cries of objectionable materials in classrooms and libraries and calling for the removal, removal, removal of material, limiting access to information and representation of individuals is gravely concerning. Librarian Joe Godwin states that a truly great library contains something to offend everyone. Our libraries should be great libraries. The email sent to staff after the shooting at Club Q in November felt insincere. The letter states, for nearly three years, we have worked on a strategic plan that puts people first and places the highest value on belonging. We are committed to living these words. They are not just words on paper. We therefore condemn this terrible act of violence. We will not stand for hatred or discrimination in our schools or our community. We must be better. We are better. Prove it. Stand up for what is right and allow D20 to be inclusive for all, safe, Our next speaker is Allison Red. I'll just mention before you start, we have 140 people listening. That's great. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. I am reading this on behalf of Esther Lee, who cannot be here tonight. Prior to public comments in these meetings, President Lavelli reads a disclaimer that concludes with, the board will not respond this evening. I've attended 20 board meetings for over a year and watched as Ms. Cons, Mr. Salt, and Mr. Lavelli have endured all manner of vile and appropriate comments and attacks directed toward them. They've been called fools, racists, sexists, accused of all forms of isms, been told their family history is racist, that they're terrified of discovering that they may have a gay family member and worse. Through it all, the three of them sit silently, with a single exception, 
endure the harshest of accusations and conducted themselves with dignity and professionalism. At the last meeting, I witnessed a first in clear defiance of the the board will not respond this evening dictate. Mrs. Cloninger did just that. In her comments, she said, I very rarely comment back to you guys when it comes to comments that you make. According to the explained Board of Education rules, there is no rarely. Either board members respond to public comments or they don't. Which is it? If board responses are allowed, then I'm sure we'd all love to hear responses from other board members who routinely sit in silence and endure nasty attacks on their persons, character, and families. Three of our board members endure harsh attacks with grace. One cannot even withstand legitimate professional criticism. Mrs. Cloninger, if you are incapable of hearing your constituents' negative critiques of your job performance or behavior, perhaps you are in the wrong position. Another part of Mr. Lavalley's disclaimer is, profanity will not be tolerated. In the future, please do not allow speakers to drop S-bombs or F-bombs from this podium as happened last meeting. Children, we are constantly being told, are watching. This too is all or nothing. Either no profanity is allowable or all is. It cannot be allowed from some, but not others. Thank you. The next speaker is Alicia Erickson. Um, real quick, I'm going to go back to let's please not elude or talk about other speakers this evening. I'd be thankful. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening, and I appreciate the time. And I also appreciate the ability to come and share opinions, which I believe is a cornerstone of our American democracy. I am the pastor of Pikes Peak Metropolitan Community Church. I live in D20. My kids are grown. Um, my mom was in public education her whole entire life. She is no longer alive. Um, I deeply believe and are, am committed and have always been committed to the principles of public education and what that does for our community and our world. I just wanted to share a little story um, of, from my own life. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I, I myself am gay. And when I was in eighth grade, I was suicidal and I had an amazing guidance school counselor who noticed that, who found that, who realized that, and who stepped in to help me through that very difficult year. And I survived and I am still here today. And I am deeply grateful for an educator, a school counselor who was able to see that and step in with care and concern for another student. My concern at this time is a lot of the public rhetoric that we're hearing is undermining the LGBTQ's ability to, the LGBTQ communities within our school districts. And it is a well-known fact that El Paso County has some of the highest child suicide rates in the country. And if we are trying to um, decrease the amount of suicide and help people achieve the age of 18, at least get through as much school as they possibly can. Not everyone can finish, but most kids hopefully can. And that's everyone's goal in public education. And um, so I just, I want to say I'm grateful for an educator who stepped in and helped me. And I hope that we can continue to build school districts and community schools that continue to do that in the future. The other thing I would just like to say is as a pastor and as someone who reads the Bible regularly, I uh, just want to point out that Jesus had nothing to say about the LGBTQ community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kendall Kelly. Hello, I am a father of two D20 students and a nine year veteran of the US Army. This year, the US Army missed its recruiting goals by 25% and other branches reported really bad numbers. This is a staggering failure. With a resurgent Russia, nuclear North Korea and China preventing, or, uh, preparing to invade Taiwan, we are short the number of troops that we need to protect America. An unacknowledged issue is that 71% of young Americans are ineligible to serve. Put another way, 24 million out of 34 million kids in the traditional young re uh, recruiting pool cannot join. One of the top causes is not meeting the minimum education requirements, which varies by branches, but generally boils down to a high school education, a uh, high school diploma.
trans battle buddies for Step It Up. 6% of military members identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. If you don't believe these stats, I did email the, uh, the references to you guys. These are significant populations within the military, yet also ones that have been traditionally let down by our ed education system. One third of LGBTQ students drop out before graduating high school, four times the national average. The main cause cited was hostile school environment. I hope the connection is obvious, but just in case I'll state it clearly. Hostile schools are forcing LGBTQ students to drop out and thus become ineligible for the military at a time that the Army calls the worst recruiting environment in the 71 year history of the all volunteer force. Instead of making our schools more accepting places and graduating more students, people in our, count, or in our country and this district are pushing for policies that will lead to more stress, more harassment, and more disengagement from our LGBTQ students. That is the wrong path for our education system. If I can't appeal to your morality, let me appeal to your pragmatism. The United States military needs an educated force to protect America in an increasingly hostile world. Every single potential recruit that's pushed out of the education system increases risk to our national security and also to the men and women that we will send to fight our wars shorthanded. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anna King. <clears throat> Appreciate my battle buddy taking on the, you know, logistic approach to this. Uh, so my name is Anna. I'm a product of the Colorado Springs School Districts. I'm also a decorated combat veteran. Come here today in an attempt to understand the thought processes for such violent and illegal decisions. Did not come from a loving, caring, nor accepting home. I did not even raise enough kind of flags to warrant any special attention from anybody else. Um, but what I did do was letter in multiple activities multiple times. I was a member of the National Honor Society. I received a full ride scholarship by my junior year. I was an athlete. I did volunteer service a member of award-winning bands, and the senior speaker for my high school graduation. However, the most violent and hateful actions ever taken against me outside of my home were sanctioned, encouraged, applauded by coaches, teachers, the administration, and parents of a high school student, um, and people that looked a lot like you. Um, in fact, of all the forms of hate and violence I faced, it was all started by two JV basketball coaches in my high school. Uh, from the student of a, or from the parents of a student that was two years my junior. And the offense you may ask that I did is that I was going to make their child gay. The punishment, vehicular assault, physical assault in a school bathroom by the other student's mother, emotional abuse, and ultimately conversion therapy. <clears throat> All of these abuses were witnessed, encouraged, and encouraged by staff. Um, and uh, what I understood and what I learned was that I did not have a, any rights and no safe spaces in that school. The consequences of learning all of this and what I need you all to understand is that it did, I did not make their child gay. It did not stop me from making an invaluable lifelong friendship. And what you guys will learn is that you will lose all Our next speaker is Kathleen Troca. Okay, no Kathleen. Next is Annie Anderson. Oh, oh, Kathleen's here. Kathleen, you're here. Yay. Oh no, oh, that's Katie. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So now we're at Kara Marshall, maybe? There we go. Thank you. Hi, yes, Kara, she, her. Um, I, missing my work party this evening, um, oddly enough, today we had harassment training. Um, and I just wanted to also mention that, um, you know, hard work doesn't always pay off. Um, I wanted to also give some examples of cisgender privilege. And if you're not familiar with the term cisgender, it means having a biological sex that matches your gender identity and expression, resulting in other people accurately perceiving your gender. 
some cisgender identity privilege. Use public restrooms without fear of verbal abuse, physical intimidation, or arrest. Use public facilities such as gym locker rooms and store changing rooms without stares, fears, or anxiety, or accusations. Uh, strangers call you by the name you provide and don't ask you what your real name is and then assume that they have a right to call you by that name. You can reasonably assume that your ability to acquire a job, rent an apartment, or secure a loan will not be denied on the basis of your gender or identity expression. You have the ability to flirt, engage in courtship, or form a relationship, or not fear that your biological status may be cause for rejection or an attack, nor will it cause your partner to question their sexual orientation or die because you wanted to dance. You have the ability to not worry about being placed in a sex segregated detention center, holding facility, jail or prison that is incongruent with your identity. If you are murdered, your gender expression will not be used as a justification for your murder. Next, next is Megan Dawkins. Hi, I'm Megan Dawkins. I'm a mom of two kids in District 20. I'm also a supporter and a member of Advocates for D20 Kids. To me, it is simple. We are just parents in the community and we know that we need to advocate for our children in these very chaotic and trying times. So here we go. Let me help clarify our position. D20 advocates are not in favor of segregated schools and we have never been. Comments stating anything other than this are intentional lies designed to ensue outrage and further divide our community. It is highly concerning to me how one's person off the cuff, and in my opinion, ill-advised question, has gotten twisted into being an official position of the D20 advocates group. This intentional misinterpretation of the truth is cancer in this community. It is reprehensible and irresponsible to incite lies against other parents while falsely accusing them. My position here is clear. I will protect my kids from things that I know are inappropriate and harmful to them. And as their parent, I take this responsibility with great conviction. And as a matter of fact, I care about all the kids' educational experience and I want it to be positive for all of them with the key word being education. I won't apologize for that, no matter what the next lie will be. I lived here my entire life, and I know a lot of people in this community, and they share the same conviction. Um, there is a silent majority here, but my silence is over. We are also in no way complicit to the horrible shooting in our community a few weeks ago. I have nothing but empathy, love, and genuine care for the victims and their families. At some point, we have to stop claiming lies to be the truth, and we begin to focus on what is right and healthy for our children. My opinion may differ from others in the community, but that certainly doesn't make it wrong. You all as board members are supported, all of you, but with that also comes great responsibility. So please use it wisely and thank you. Next, next is Jen Jasa. Hi, I'm Jennifer J. Celarue. Um, I am a parent of two kids in the district, but tonight I'm reading a parent letter for someone who could not attend. They would like to thank the board and superintendent for their service to D20. They're a parent and they reside within the D20 boundaries. I'm gonna read in the I since it's how it's written. I am a PTA and SAC member at my children's school. I write to you tonight to express my concerns regarding the ongoing appeals that are being heard by the board. I encourage the board to keep the books that have been brought to your attention. I will speak tonight about Steal This Country. As a young adult and before technology, I remember the story of Julia Butterfly Hill. She was an environmental activist who lived for 738 days in a thousand year old California redwood named Luna to prevent it from being cut down. I remember strolling my local bookstores when I came upon a zine written by Ms. Hill. Long before social media and Google Maps, my roommate and I sat out to discover the area she was residing in. To this day, I am still surprised that we made it using basic navigation. 
With open minds and excited hearts, we were called to a movement I was never taught in my Midwestern upbringing. I am thankful for Ms. Styron for including Ms. Hill in her book because it flooded me of memories of how my activism began, as well as why I now fight for public education. I would be remiss to not mention that D20 contains three Turning Point USA chapters, two of which are located within our neighborhood high schools. The website directly describes their activists as community organizers for the right to empower, organize, and mobilize. It is interesting to think that Steal This Country and other books based on civil engagement have received so much attention when a large organization with the goal of dismantling the foundation of public education is populating D20 high schools without notice. Thank you to the board for your past votes. Please know that parents in D20 support and trust our librarians. Their expertise should be praised rather than questioned. Thank you all. Our next speaker is Bernadette Guthrie. Two weeks prior to the Club Q massacre, a parent stood here and stated that she feared that the increase of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric at this podium would result, result in a lone wolf hate crime scenario and that she'd begun researching bulletproof backpacks for her kids. Listening to those words the day after the shooting was truly chilling. Let me be very clear. No one is saying that anyone in this room or those associated with any parent group are being blamed for the actions of one deranged individual. That said, we would be ignorant to not see the direct link from anti-LGBTQ rhetoric to crimes fueled by hate. Those who continue to obsess over teachers asking preferred pronouns, bathrooms, locker rooms, inclusive language, and the sexual preferences of others are all fanning the flame, and those who entertain these conversations or policy proposals are complicit in the perpetuation of hate, not to mention towing the line of legality. I feel it's important tonight to clarify some facts. Fact, the Quora that was obtained this week clearly documented a meeting between members who identified themselves as member, members of Advocates for D20 Kids and D20 staff. Fact, those meeting minutes contained a suggestion from said advocate member to ASD staff to segregate queer kids from the straight kids. Fact, Mr. Lavalley and Mrs. Kahn's are part of this group and their membership is documented since May 16th of 2022. Fact, Mr. Lavalley lied in an email to me today about this fact. If you cannot see how your continued association with a group that would feel comfortable thinking something that that vile, let alone verbalizing it, is being complicit, then we are at an impasse. Lastly, if the gaslighting we've all heard tonight from advocates is true and the suggestion of segregation by one of their members never happened, I strongly suggest you investigate your legal and IT. Time ups. Next is Thomas Alberg. Do we have a Thomas Alberg? Okay. Next is Laura Matisic. I'm appalled by the hate speech that's oozed from this podium, ironically uninterrupted. I guess if someone doesn't challenge your male fragility, Mr. Lavalley, then anything goes, right? Most of these comments are coming from the conservative group known as Advocates for D20, but this is a guise for being an unhinged and hateful group set on harming and excluding the LGBTQ plus community. You see, this conservative group has leaders that are friends with you, Mr. Lavalley, Mr. Salt, and Mrs. Kahn's, and they have suggested to executives that we segregate LGBTQ students into their own schools. They have said that you, Mr. Salt, are guiding them on how to get around the strategic plan and that you, Mr. Lavalley, and Mrs. Kahn's have attended meetings and we have pictures of you there. Remember a few months ago when I told you that you are the company you keep? Well, your company is full of bigots, cowards, and misled individuals trying to cause harm to others. You see, intolerance breeds exclusion, which breeds hate, which breeds violence, which then breeds hate crimes and murders into existence. 
what is being suggested not only viola violates federal and state law, but also the oath you took. You are a disgrace to this school board and district, and I promise to make sure that all families, and especially those that belong to the LGBTQ plus community, feel a sense of true belonging and support. Unlike you, my active duty husband took an oath to serve this country, and he is more than proud to stand with the LGBTQ plus community and serve alongside them. Mr. Gregory, I need to know your position now more than ever. What has been suggested by this hate group cannot go unnoticed and unspoken of. It is a fact that it happened. Mrs. Cloninger and Mr. Temby, we need you now more than ever. We appreciate your love and support for all families and your dedication to this district. Remember, silence is violence and makes you complicit in all acts of harm against the LGBTQIA plus community and other marginalized communities. Don't be cowards and don't be bigots and always speak up. I always will. Thank you. Next, next is Nathaniel Bergstrom. Hello, my name is Nathaniel Bergstrom and I'm a sophomore at Rampart High School. Some members of our Board of Education have been supporting and discussing policies that are harmful to groups of students, specifically the LGBTQ plus community. Mr. Lavalley, our school board president, and Ms. Collins have been found upon a CORA meeting up with an individual who are a request of the board and boardroom I will not name, discussing policies on transgender bathrooms on at least one occasion. <clears throat> this same person later proposed something to our superintendent that would be both illegal and immoral regarding transgender bathrooms. Based on these facts, it is cause and correlation that has led me to assume that you were a part of approving of and or making this proposition. This is not fueling academic excellence. It is doing the exact opposite, quashing it out for a group of people. Separate from Ms. what Mr. Lavalle and Ms. Cons were doing, Mr. Salt addressed the Advocates for D20 group on how to best propose changes to the strategic plan. This is concerning to me as a student, seeing our members of our Board of Education are trying to change something that has been fueling our academic excellence for years, all due to personal opinions. The fact is that some members of the board are being heavily influenced due to their own personal opinions, not looking at what is best for our students. At the end of the day, all the Board of Education is here to do is to further academic excellence of students, and that is not done when a group of students feel unsafe and unwelcome due to something that they cannot control. I urge Mr. Lavalle, Mr. Salt, and Ms. Cons to rethink their decisions of meeting with these people in the future and aligning themselves with groups with such views if they truly do strive to help further the academic achievement of all students. Thank you. Our next, stu our next speaker is Jennifer Bergstrom. Okay, we heard earlier today um, uh, the email that was sent out to the D20 teachers following the Club Q shooting. Um, it reaffirmed D20's commitment to ensure all people are safe, accepted, and feel a true sense of belonging. Furthermore, it stated that moving forward, we'll engage in the work that pushes past our differences, judgments, and assumptions, and ensures that all people have dignity, respect, and are fully appreciated. I look forward to the D20 Board of Education standing by this commitment and backing these words with meaningful, consistent actions, because that's how we begin to move forward. And I look forward to seeing the board walk this talk by no longer entertaining and encouraging those who seek to erase our kids' histories and truths, who seek to push them back into closets. I expect the board instead to embrace diversity, to embody it throughout the District 20 culture. Ms. Cloninger and Mr. Temby, I appreciate that you both consistently conduct your business in a fair and balanced manner. I expect that other board members will not continue to align themselves with groups or individuals that peddle, peddle transphobia and homophobia under the guise of parental rights 
or concern for academic achievement. I am certain that I will never again hear the words woke or indoctrinate when speaking of our teachers and staff, and that instead you will replace this with reassurance that parents can continue to trust the teachers who provided our children with an education that has brought with it 14 years of being accredited with distinction. I look forward to seeing the work that will celebrate and honor diversity rather than labeling it controversial or inappropriate and as such something that cannot be taught or displayed. And finally, I can't wait to see all the wonderful and inclusive books that teachers will be able to finally read to students, thus providing all students with representation that ensures belonging and for all. The next speaker is Charlotte Johnson. Apologies for my voice. <clears throat> my name is Charlotte. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a parent of two D20 kids. I want to get something straight. We're supposed to believe that having access to material that affirms the inherent worth of other human beings creates confusion in young people. We're supposed to believe that some kids feel offended by teachers asking them their pronouns. We're supposed to believe that the presence of a pride flag is shoving sex in people's faces. We're supposed to believe that people not being able to harass minorities gets in the way of practicing our religion. But then we're also supposed to believe that letting people stand up in board meetings and calling our kids predators and groomers is just fine. When do we call, when do we all call it out for the hateful, hateful bigotry that it is, putting our children in harm's way? When do we stop letting these people abuse our children for their own political purposes? We should be teaching our children how to live in a world where other people are different. It's an important life skill to be able to exist with people of different races, religions, gender identities, or who love people of the same sex. I work in the field of medicine and no student or graduate will do very well without these skills. Math and science will get them in the door, but it's not enough to keep them there. This is education. We don't do our kids any justice by teaching them that the very existence of other people is something to be offended by or inappropriate. Unfortunately, some people think it's their right to harass and oppress others. We know they're not going to stop. It's the responsibility of the board and the administrators to not tolerate or entertain that behavior. Don't fall for the idiotic, you have to tolerate my intolerance logical fallacy. I urge the board to embrace the words said on the district Facebook page a couple of weeks ago. Together, we must all work to ensure our community and city is one where all people are safe and free. Let's do this for all of our students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael O'Hare. Yeah, I was not gonna speak tonight, but I've been out of town. I would like to say that this unfortunate incident that happened, um, I'm part of the advocates for D20 and I had no idea uh, why all these people were here tonight. I started to question some of the people. They were quite rude. They bullied me to a certain extent. And I'm a big guy so I can take the bullying, but I just want to start a dialogue. I just wanted to understand their side. I just want to get there, you know, why they were here, why they're so passionate. I didn't want to call anybody names. I didn't want to be nasty. I, all I did was ask questions. And I know our country is very divided, but I think it's very important that we should be able to come together and speak to each other. Some people got upset with some of my questions and why I was even questioning them. And I did have a nice dialogue. I was sitting in the corner over there with one of the members of the LGBTQ community and they were explaining everything to me. And I was suddenly surrounded by cops, about six or seven of them. And they took me outside and they questioned me. And I was accused of being an agitator and I was accused of being hostile. I was none of those things. And I'm standing before you right now to defend my honor, my reputation and integrity. 
I would stand and defend every one of your rights, your right to life, your right to your sexual orientation, and everything else. I just hope you would respect mine and the other people. I'm not here. Maybe we will disagree on, on things, but I um, prefer. Point of order. We do need to speak just to the board. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I agree, Ms. Condra. Thank you. I would prefer clarity over agreement because so we're not going to agree on everything. But that's the only way we're going to be able to come together and solve these problems in our community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mike Jones. Thank you. I stand in agreement with those in District 20 who have called for an end to hate speech. The following message was posted by a member of the D20 community onto Facebook, arguably the single most pop public of all spaces in America today. Quote, a black white supremacist is a white white supremacist's favorite white supremacist. You see it locally, a black man declaring there is no such thing as systemic racism in the education system and the defenders of white supremacy flocking to prop him up. You see it nationally, a black man wearing a White Lives Matter shirt and the defenders of white supremacy flocking to prop him up. Don't be fooled by what the, what the world would have you believe racism and white supremacy looks like. It's not always a Southern white man, pointy white hoods and burning crosses. End of quote. Obviously, this individual is speaking about a member of the D20 advocates of which I'm a member. Since we are by far the most diverse parent organization in the district, this, is this love or hate speech? I think most would say it's hate. Accusing others of hate speech out of one side of one's mouth and then spewing it out the other is not fostering healing. If we're gonna stand against hate speech, we gotta stand against all of it, not just the which helps move our personal, political, or ideological preferences forward. And just one last thing, can we please stop with the black white supremacist thing? It's like calling me svelte and that Big Macs and pepperoni pizza are health food. It's dumb and it's a lie. Thank you and Merry Christmas. Our next speaker is William Swavel. Good evening, board. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of mudslinging tonight and a lot of name calling. So I want to bring us back on track to some some facts. Uh, during the first book review, Tom, you made a comment about how there was no sexual com uh, uh, statements in that book. I I would uh, absolutely disagree, and I'm going to quote those those portions of, the, of that book. So the image was upside down, putting Mitch McConnell's dying, dying turtle mouth right over Aunt Zippy's precious portal. And the same dirty ass Uncle Sam that was giving out cash, land, and pursuits of happiness to our fair skinned siblings while fondling us inappropriately behind closed doors. Point of order, uh, language with cursing. Hey, if we can't talk, if I can't say it here, why is it in a school? So keep your laws off my gender fluids. That sounds like sexual comments to me. But focusing just on that portion by itself is, is, uh, not looking at the whole picture. There's racism, there's xenophobia and discrimination in those same books, including this one right here, Still This Country, that everybody keeps talking about. <clears throat> As an example, talking about hypocrisy, um, the Christian Club. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about, how that was suppressed. There were attempts at suppressing a Christian Club. And it, and it took a legal letter to get you guys to do the right thing. I didn't go looking for these books in the school. Uh, several folks have made that comment. That's an outright lie. I saw them as I was walking by. And now I have a right to say, hey, what's what's the deal with this? And no, there was not a, a, a YA sticker on that second book. I have pictures of the book and I can show it to you guys. I have proof. So when you guys have questions about about these books, I would ask you to talk to me. I'm the parent who said I have a problem with these books. 
talk to me, not to these people who have not who haven't read. Time is up. Who's next? Our next speaker is M.G. Peterson. Good evening, board. I am a parent in District 20, and tonight I stand in agreement with those who call for an end to hate speech, all hate speech. The following is a message that was posted by a member of the D20 community onto the personal Facebook page of an Advocates for D20 Kids member. Quote, you're an amateur, stop while you're ahead, go back to blanking off in tube socks to Charlie Cook posters. I know ladies aren't your thing, so I do not expect anything less, end of quote. Isn't this vulgarity and gay bashing an actual form of hate speech? It is at least hateful speech in that it conveys hate and ill will from one person to another. And this hateful comment was placed onto a public Facebook wall for all to see. So if we're going to stand against hateful speech, we must stand against all of it not use it for the advancement of political or ideological agendas, ideological agendas, while condemning it when it's not aligned with those agendas. Again, I stand with those who call for an end to hate speech, not just because of the feelings it hurts or the hatefulness in the heart that it reveals or the disregard for life that it conveys, but also because it does not advance the mission of this district. It actually counters the mission and it counters the purpose of this public comment forum. It's a lot of trash when we should be down to business. Now, although my example was from Facebook, I have observed you, the board, at these meetings and I commend you board members for honoring the free speech right of all speakers, even when their words do not meet the baseline decency assigned by this right are not a wise and responsible exercising of the right of free speech. Do not. Next is Dana Rasmussen. <laughs> My name is Dana Rasmussen, she, her, hers, and I'm team trans. I will read my remarks to prevent me from going on a rage-filled tirade, rage tirade. An excerpt from Colorado Law 24-34601, discrimination in places of public accommodation to which public educational facilities are subject states this. It is a discriminatory practice and unlawful for a person directly or indirectly to refuse, withhold from, or deny to any individual or group because of a disability, race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, national origin, or ancestry, the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privilege, advantages, and accommodations of a place of public accommodation. Most of the policies being discussed between some board members of some of these board members and the group advocates for D20 students are in direct violation of this law. Others are just hurtful and dangerous to LGBTQ people. Proposed policy point, parent involvement will be requested of the student when a gender identity change is being expressed. The outing of a student to a potentially unsupportive parent and others can have real and long lasting damaging effects. I personally know this because the fear that I felt of being found out drove me to develop ulcers and attempt suicide at age 12. I did not feel safe coming out until decades later at age 51. 
policy point. A request to use staff bathroom is made of the student. Direct violation of this law. Policy point, written record to make the student's new identity. Sorry, time's up. Who's next? Next is Lindsay Contraveros. I am a resident of D20. I am a parent of two students currently attending D20 schools. I'm a 20 year Air Force veteran. I am a Christian and I am an LGBTQ plus ally. As board members, you are supposed to serve all students in this district, not just the ones you agree with or whose parents you agree with. All means all. At a bare minimum, it means you must proactively include and protect all students, regardless of race, gender, gender identity, or sexual orientation. It has come to my attention that a member of the Advocates for D20 Students group has proposed a separate school for the LGBTQ plus community. The idea that students should be segregated because they are LGBTQ or that there should only be one school in the district in which they are safe is appalling. Another suggestion which was emailed to our superintendent by a member of that group was a transgender bathroom policy to include that transgender students should be counseled on the potential ramifications of transitioning and using opposite gender bathrooms to include the risk of sexual assault. Seriously? This is nothing more than an intimidation tactic aimed at keeping transgender youth from being themselves. It's also victim blaming, blaming a transgender student for a possible assault against him or her, and it's despicable. Instead of giving guidance to transgender students about the risks of assault, let's give guidance to all students that those assaults will not be tolerated. Let's remember that we are talking about children here and all children have an absolute right to feel and be safe in our schools. The only acceptable response from this board to both of these ridiculous and ignorant suggestions is no. I look forward to you publicly and unanimously stating that much. Our LGBTQ youth deserve no less. Next is Sarah Simon. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Sarah Simon. I am a member of the Advocates for D20 Kids, and I'm also losing my voice. I'll begin by quoting the words of a uh, D20 community member who posted on Facebook just hours after the Club Q tragedy. And I quote, I've spoken on behalf of the LGBTQ community multiple times as hateful school board members have lobbed attacks at them time and time again. In light of the hateful violence that happened here in Colorado Springs, name redacted, has blood on her hands, as does anybody who isn't standing up against her hateful words that flow from her hateful heart, end quote. Now, I searched this posting a few times for any concrete examples of the D20 board meeting members being hateful towards this community, but I, alas, did not find any. The Club Q shooting happened at 11.56 p.m., this post that a school board member has quote blood on her hands was posted just 11 hours later. So before any investigation had been done, before the loved ones had any time to grieve, already the school board here in front of me was being wrongly associated with this very horrendous crime. We've since learned that the killer identifies as non-binary non member of the LGBT community and is far from being aligned in any way with conservative leaders on this board or any place else. Attacks like this one on our school board are completely irresponsible and certainly not constructive. I don't expect the author of that Facebook post to ever issue this board any type of apology for leveling false accusations, so I'd like to go ahead and apologize on their behalf. We in the D20 community are sincerely sorry that you need to endure these attacks. I know it's not what you signed up for, 
when you ran for office to serve our school district. We appreciate your willingness to endure this aid in service to our children and our Point of order, please. This is the last request to make sure that you are not speaking during the public comment. Please be respectful. If you're going to talk about respect, please be respectful. Thank you. Next is Drew Kennedy. Hello, board. My name is Bill Smith. Um, Mr. Kennedy asked me to read a statement on his behalf. Yeah. I don't think we can do that. No can do. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. All right, no problem. Thanks. Okay. Next is Ty Johnson. So my name is Dr. Ty Johnson. Um, I'm a resident of the district and I have three wonderful kids who are products of this district. And um, I'm ashamed to say I've never been to a school board meeting before. So I came today to see what this all is about. And I'm disgusted at what I hear. I was hoping to hear more of what we did in the beginning. What are we doing to increase academic excellence? What are we doing to help our kids who were damaged by this unscientific disastrous shutdown and mass mandates. And I've heard nothing. I've heard social issues that, in my opinion, shouldn't be here. So I'm here to encourage you guys and to ask you, because I am part of the silent majority. We've kept our ear to the ground. We've elected each and every one of you to represent us. And I want you guys to focus on academic excellence. That's what school is all about. The social issues can happen elsewhere. Yes, I understand we have to keep everybody safe and that needs to be a priority too, but we're here for school, for academics. And there's people like me who will no longer be silent. I've had nothing to do with, you know, I don't even know the name of it, the Academy District 20 kids, but as of this moment, I'm part of it. Why? Because of the vitriol rhetoric that's been coming out and the lack of focus on academics. My kids have succeeded massively because this school district taught them how to think, not what to think. And they've been able to take that to massive success and every child needs that opportunity. And this is the one country in the world they can get it if we focus on academics. So I encourage you and I implore you to stay focused on academics. Let's hear more of what we heard in the beginning. Thank you. Next is Jennifer Mattis. Good evening. I'm grateful that Dr. Field and Ms. Patterson were able to go first so this huge audience tonight could hear the wonderful academic excellence of our district and hear the statistics and the actual proof to show where we're at. I'm here tonight to talk about financial responsibility. As board members, one of your jobs is to oversee the D20 budget. Some of you do not support the free meals for students initiative that was passed last month. Some of you do not support mill levies for our schools or for the Pikes Peak Libraries District. You have CORA rights as well. At the end of this school year, I ask that you make a CORA request in D49 to find out how much money was paid to Brad Miller because of the lawsuits created by board member Ivy Lou. Rather than step down from her board position, Ivy chose to double down on her hate speech and drain school funds with legal fees. Her choices do not support academic excellence. Three of you are involved with the Advocates Group. Mr. Lavalli, you stated you were not aware of the Advocates' call for segregation of students until you saw the CORA report. Now you have read the notes and you are aware. After the Club Q tragedy, you signed the district-wide email saying the safety of all students is a priority. You cannot put your name on this email and support this group at the same time. Mr. Lavalli, Ms. Cons, and Aaron, all three of you are now fully aware of the agenda of the Advocates Group. If any of you continues to support or be a part of this group, even if it's on your own time, it is going to create a ridiculously unnecessary lawsuits for our district. 
If you are a part of Moms for Liberty or the Advocates for D20 groups, you're sending a direct message that you do not support the safety of all 26,000 students and staff in our district. Please match your actions to your words. Thank you. Next is Ann McComer. Do we have Ann McComer? Hi, I'm Ann McComer and an advocate for District 20 Kids. I'm also a D20 parent and grandparent, having lived in the district for 41 years. As I've come to realize how much D20 has done for the LGBTQ plus community, as far as providing counseling for students and staff bathrooms if needed for those transitioning, it occurred to me that district-wide policy may need some clarity. I'm a little confused. As a district, are you allowed to make your own decision to declare birth gender bathrooms usage only? Or do you follow the state's version of transitioning students' use of gender preferred bathrooms in District 20? Is this a site-based issue the board should even be discussing? It just seems to me that if the two different, differing site-based policies were in effect in the district and our community was aware of them at each of the individual schools, it might put those teachers, parents, and students at ease with that clarity. And remember, when it just went away, oh, time don't go away. Ah, I had a little bit more to go here. Um, I just want to remind you that the advocates for District 20 kids do not support segregating schools, and we never have. It's a bad idea, period, end of story. And I thank you, Mr. Lavelle, for having stated that at the very beginning. So why is it being regenerated? The outrage generated over this issue is disingenuous. It's not intended to serve the best interest of the kids. It's simply designed to generate controversy and make District 20 appear a battleground. I thank you, board, for all you're doing to address these delicate situations. Sorry, your time's up. Next is John McComer. After 50 some years, I have learned to play second fiddle occasionally. I'm John McComer, District 20 resident for over 40 years, parent of two children and two grandchildren who have graduated from District 20 schools. Here's today's headline on the social media Reddit. And this takes a direct quote from uh, Defense of Democracy Colorado Facebook page. I was concerned, especially after reading the mostly hateful comments attached to the article. So I did what the author and very few of the commentators had, uh, commenters had done. I talked to some of the people involved and I did some investigating. I quickly learned that this diatribe is filled with half-truths, innuendo, unwarranted conclusions, and straight lies. The outraged comments show that sadly, we live in a society where many people rely on headlines for their news and don't do some simple homework. Contrary to the Reddit post, parents have not proposed segregated schools, nor is the school board talking about it. Both of these statements are completely false. However, thanks to social media, this stuff gets written and posted and then taken as truth by many who read it. Shame on those who promoted this lie in the first place and on the media who are running with it as if it's true. The article also states advocates for District 20 students have been witnessed colluding on multiple occasions with D20 board members. Throughout the history of our representative republic, it's been considered a good thing when elected representatives meet and spend time with their constituents. Well, in District 20, apparently it's become a bad thing at least in the eyes of some, as we now see a growing chorus of people commenting in these meetings and online that meeting with parents is some form of evil. Board members do meet with parents and constituents and that should be encouraged, not criticized. I applaud you for taking time from your busy schedules to listen to parents' issues or concerns. And I wouldn't have the audacity to say who you should or shouldn't meet with. The day should never come that you board members stop meeting and communicating with parents and we're grateful to you for your willingness to do so. 
The fact that some people who complain about everything see that as a problem. Next is Katie Chukas. Hi, I'm Catherine Chukas. I live in the district. I'm an Air Academy parent. My animal update today is about the Immune Society. There's lots of lovely gentle dogs who need homes. There's also been a lot of cuddle with the dog sessions at the private education institutions that I'm a part of. It's a major stress reliever for the students and staff here in Colorado Springs. And maybe that's something we think about for Thursday evenings here at the EAC. My main comments tonight are about the superintendent selection criteria being discussed at the earlier work session. I hope through the comments of others today, you're seeing the dangers of having an outsider national agendas come through at this local level. Um, in an Academy District 20, it's time to quash the outsiders topics that other transgender people. Verbal and written messages to the board that, that seek to limit the rights of transgender, transgender individuals are harmful. These messages are not worth the board members time and attention, and you should say so publicly and privately. As board members, in my opinion, your limited time should be focused on the superintendent search. When you think about the criteria to give your search consultants, experience with our operations matter. We are a district with 14 years of academic success, a district with multiple thriving public school sites, a tradition of site-based management for 40 plus public school sites, and two, two charter school systems that are funded fairly. That's why I encourage the search to focus on leading districts within the country who have multiple high school sites and have 25,000 students. That's why I gave you examples previously of Naperville, Illinois and Aurora, Illinois, to expand your frame of reference. Our district is different from any high achieving, high, uh, high achieving district in the country with one high school. It's a different scale of operations to manage and execute the budget and the strategic plan against. You'll want a leader who knows how to manage many great principles, who knows how to manage these principles to achieve their best, how to attract and retain high quality educators, and how to work with a demanding group of upper middle class stakeholders. Ask your search consultants for candidates with experience with our size and quality of district. You're paying them to do this work on our behalf for all 100,000 stakeholders in D20. Ask them for more. Next is Leah Smith. Good evening, I'm Lee Smith and I'm here with the Advocates for D20 Kids. D20 is in a, at a critical juncture as you choose the next superintendent. In my experience as a parent and past employee of D20, most teachers desire to educate students to help them reach their highest potential. Most teachers cherish the support of dedicated parents who are willing to come alongside them to reach this goal and most teachers create an atmosphere for learning by teaching facts and encouraging reason, reasoning. Across the country, and even in this district, our schools have become increasingly, increasingly politicized to the point that political ideologies are being aggressively inserted into every facet of the classroom and curriculum, such as CRT and gender ideology. Polarizing political beliefs cause detrimental effects in, a, in the educational system such as friction between teachers and parents, trapping students awkwardly in the middle. As you consider applicants for our new superintendent, it is my hope and prayer that you would choose a person who has a proven track record of leadership. One who will A, cultivate an environment that promotes the growth of, and growth of knowledge and educational achievements for all students. B, one who respects parental rights and encourages a strong teacher parent working relationship, recognizing that this is a formula for student success. And C, one who fosters safety and respect for all individuals, and yet has the wisdom to stand firm against influences that disrupt the primary function of education and use of classroom time. Lastly, an individual who believes in teaching students how to think and not what to think. Thank you all for your devotion to the community by your willingness to serve on this D20. Sorry, your time's up, thank you. Our next speaker is Bill Smith. That's when you thought I was gone, right? Um, <clears throat> Fiscal the Valley and the board. 
Uh, I've attended the last two D20 board meetings. And to be honest, I don't know how you do this job with all the anger directed towards you, but I know why you do this job. And I wanna thank you all for, for your commitment to our D20 kids. Please continue to be brave and courageous. Let us parents, teachers, and board members run with endurance the race that is set before us. So thank you all for, for what you do as you serve here. Our next speaker is Derek Wilburn. Good evening, board, superintendent. I stand tonight in agreement with those who have called for an end to hate speech. Through a Colorado Open Records request, uh, other people can do that too, I obtained the following email sent to President Lavalley. quote, you are the trash that infiltrates our schools. You are the epitome of white cisgender male fragility. Your words are armed with violence. We will never stop watching your every move. You have absolutely screamed you are loud and proud to be a white nationalist. We will continue to push the media and everything we, with everything we have to show who you are, a demon who walks amongst us. Get therapy. Your childhood issues do not give you the right to be a horrible human. I pray that you're a believer because only then will you understand the consequences of being such a horrid human. You will burn, you will be tortured. Your entire afterlife has been set in stone, but through your actions only. Angels aren't here to protect you. They are here to smite horrible humans and your time will come. Don't you ever purse your lips to pretend to know what God wants. He didn't ask for your help. In fact, you embarrass him. May you and your family receive all the blessings they have requested as it comes back three times. Leave our schools. You have no business around children. Keep your misogynistic abuse in your own home. We'll let God deal with you. Have fun burning in the hell you've created for yourself, end quote. If we're going to stand against hate speech, we must stand against it all. Tonight alone, advocates for D20 kids have been called a hate group, Nazis, mullahs, federates, confederates, bigots, cowards, misled, tyrants, and murderers. Tonight alone from this podium, by the same people who call for an end to the hate speech, if we're going to stand against hate speech, and we must and we should, we must stand against all of it. Thank you, board, and Merry Christmas. Next is Edward Waldrop. Hello, my name is Dr. Eddie Waldrop, a D20 parent and resident. Uh, I'd like to thank you school board members and thank you for your service to our community. My comments here today are my own and not reflective of any institution. <laughs> I would like to encourage the board and staff to remain focused on academic excellence as the difficult process of selecting a superintendent continues. I'd like to thank Mr. Gregory for your skill and thoughtfulness. Um, and these are large shoes to fill. You've been great, so thank you. Uh, I hope that the selection committee is dedicated to canvassing applicants and select a highly qualified individual who continue his legacy and leadership. I do hope that uh, the successful candidate will be someone who brings values, of uh, viewpoint diversity, individual integrity, and sees individuals as worthy of inherent dignity and worth while rejecting the current zeitgeist of superimposed group identities. Uh, on a different topic, you know, our community has recently been dealt a heavy blow with the attack on Club Q. Yeah, I have family and friends who have been affected by this, and I'm confident that the district is doing everything in your ability to support the community and the students affected by this. Um, I want to thank you for that. It means a lot to me, and I'm sure it means a lot to the community as well, um, that we have such heartfelt and dedicated people within the district. And I would just like to say that I also am kind of disappointed by the amount of kind of anger and vitriol. And I hope that we're able to encourage more of a civil discourse in the future. So thank you.
The next speaker is Autumn Bird. Oh, do I talk? Okay, sorry. Um, hi, I go by Autumn. I'm a new, newly out trans person. Um, I'm super nervous about talking. A uh, few things about me, I am a D20 parent. I'm a combat vet in the Marines. Um, a lot of trans friends that helped me survive this last year. I'm here because I'm shaken by what I read. It took me to 40 to come out. It was super hard to figure out. I'm not surprised, um, or do I really feel anything about uh, these people that are, that feel so threatened by people like me. But what I'm concerned about is the institution's response. Okay. I have a proposal. Take a vote. I don't know how these things work. Um, identify who would vote against not taking these kinds of hate organ organizations seriously. They have the freedom of speech, but we can determine policy for how to handle it. This is a problem. It needs to stop. These kids have it rough. Okay, it's, it's super hard. We need to help them out. That's it, thanks. Our next speaker is Cole Danielson. Do we have a Cole Danielson? Next is Vanessa Wilcox. Testing. Mm -hmm. I grew up in District 20. I have gone to more schools than I can remember in this district. And I can tell you, as a transgender female who's come out at the age of 27, I really wish that I had had teachers and supportive peers around me to tell me that it's okay to be myself. Because I didn't receive that, School didn't matter to me. None of all of the things that you all are talking about mattered to me because it didn't feel like I was cared for. It didn't feel like who I was mattered. And it felt like I was wrong for existing as a human being with these confusing feelings inside. I became violent by high school. I joined a stupid wannabe gang because I felt like that was going to be the reason for my safety. And to a degree it was, it kept me safe because I knew I had a group of peers who would protect me against other people should they know anything about me. If you want to make an open and inclusive area for children, all of us are wasting your time and you need to stand strong with your policies and you need to decide your policies. You also need to separate yourselves from groups that are tied here. Because to me, that's a conflict of interest. And I can tell you if I was a child going through District 20 right now, 
I, and I was transgender, such as I am right now, I would be very scared for my future. And I would ask my parents to take me out of the district because I Our next speaker is Chelsea S. Do we have a Chelsea S? No, okay. Uh, next is Kyan Wilcox. No Kyan Wilcox? Okay. Um, next would be Kyle Guthrie. Good evening. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of a representative from Moms for Liberty today. Good evening. I would like to start today by thanking our students, teachers, staff, admin, board members, and superintendent of D20 for all your hard work this school year. Your accomplishments are not going unnoticed. Our board members have dedicated so much of their time already this year, unpaid, to watch over the district and the kids, and I thank you for the true de your true dedication and generosity. What I have observed here at this school board meeting as I have sat for hours alongside our dedicated staff and board members is community member after community member talk about adults. What about our children? I am here today to talk about the children of District 20. The children have worked hard and helped gain the title accredited with distinction. This honor was only achieved by 11 districts in the state and D20 is the largest di district in that group of 11. The children's hard work has propelled this district into the top, into the top third spot academically in the region. The children have had many achievements that have impressive results nationwide and statewide. According to Niche, D20 is ranked 744 out of nearly 11,000 for the best school district in Colorado. I'm sorry, in America, number eight out of 180 for best district in Colorado and number 25 out of 180 districts in athletics in Colorado. D20 is an average graduation rate of 93%. Not to be outdone by the D20, not to be outdone, the D20 teachers that ranked an impressive 25 out of 180. The children are the reason we are all here. The children are the link that we have in common. It is clear that the focus has not slipped away from the children when it comes to District 20's impressive teachers, staff, admin, board members, and principals. Please put the focus back on the children. After all, that is why we are here today, and thank you. Now, on a personal note, when she asked me to read this, I felt heart, a, a warm-hearted sensation that this was gonna be a positive meeting. And I apologize for the vitriol and the names you've been called in this meeting. And I've learned a lot from it, and I've learned that I need to be more involved in this in this uh, democratic process. And I apologize on behalf of everyone who has spoken to you the way. Next is Aaron Davitt. My name is Erin Davitt, pronouns are she and they. I'm a queer, autistic, single parent, first responder, and adult foster care provider, and I've been a member of this community since I moved here in 2005. I was a bartender and then made a career change in a wildland fire and EMS. I have fought fire as a volunteer for the Sheriff's Office and as a federal employee and worked at Peakview, the EDs at Memorial Central and North, and at Evans in the ED and on the ambulance. I recognize folks in this very building who I've treated. I now spend the vast majority of my time advocating and caring for my kid and some of the most vulnerable people in our community. My entire adult life has centered around service to others, but believe it or not, I don't believe in a God. In our house, the Bible is at best an interesting book and at worst, it's a dangerous weapon. My child was a gender non-conforming D20 student last school year in the Head Start classroom. Our experience with D20 special ed, refusing needed evaluations and resistance to my child's gender expression was troubling enough that I expended in an inordinate amount of energy this summer to choice my kid into D11. It required a US Department of Education complaint and months of back and forth, but in the end, we got what we needed. We're moving soon, and I made sure that the house I chose was not in District 20, specifically because of rhetoric like we're hearing this evening. One may claim that I no longer have a dog in this fight, but I'm here to tell you that we all do. Must I remind the board and those in attendance that public schools are what's called a public accommodation. 
Colorado's anti-discrimination laws guarantee equal access to public accommodations, housing, and employment, regardless of disability, race, creed, color, sex, sexual orientation, including transgender status, marital status, family status, religion, national origin, and ancestry. Now, I don't know what rules y'all follow, but I know some of these folks are under the impression that their religious rules supersede those of the state. The issue with that is, okay, well, first of all, so I've seen firsthand kids in crisis because of this rhetoric. I've taken care of a 13-year-old girl who didn't die from her Tylenol OD, but were, would require a liver transplant. I've been in the trauma room and started bilateral IVs for a 15-year-old male self-inflicted Our next speaker is Hayden Michael. Okay, we'll go to Jim Robertson. Good evening, board, Super Gregory. So tonight we've been suffering through the progressives continuous berating of the board, the advocates for kids and others for all kinds of things that are just simply not true. Nobody is buying any of this nonsense. The manufactured hysteria is to distract you and all of us. And while everyone is looking at the squirrel, they sneak in their crazy agenda. It's been going on for years and it's coming to an end and they're becoming unhinged. There are many differences between what I will call progressives and conservatives, and I'll list three. Conservatives want a rigorous classical education and furthering academic excellence for all students in preparation to enter the real world. Progressives want a radical curriculum full of perverted and twisted ideas and concepts so our children wind up on the government dull sleeping in tents out on the street. Conservatives want parents deeply involved in their children's education, health, and safety. Progressives want parents to hand over their children to be used as laboratory mice for their experimentation on alternative lifestyles, bodily mutilation, and a future life full of emotional and physical damage. Conservatives want mentally, emotionally, ethically, spiritually strong young adults ready to meet the challenges of the real world. Progressives want these young lives to be inundated with gender transition professionals, mental therapists, and sexual counselors. The bottom line, my opinion, they don't give a damn about academic excellence, the safety of our Point children. Point of order, no, no uh, profanity, please. Apologize, or about you or I as a parent. Board, you have the power and the overwhelming community support to eliminate these distractions and focus back on education. The battle is for the future of our children and conservatives are awake now and pissed. We have the number, we have the numbers, and we are in it for the long haul. Most important, on our side. Thank you. Our last and final speaker is Tiana Clark. All right, I kind of threw, threw a few different things together. Um, first thing I do want to say, uh, whatever you want to call it, CRT, Black history, US history, is not a distraction. And if you consider it one, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you should attend Rampart High School's Black history class and learn. I am here today to talk about the strategic plan uh, I know that there is a lot of dissection of it going on. And as the sole parent who stood almost two years on the task force going through it, I can tell you that there was a process. And if you want to know what it was, I am happy to sit down with anybody and kind of go over what that was. Some people want parental rights without parental involvement without attending anything at the school, without going to PTO meetings, without reading the emails, without helping the teachers, without getting supplies for the kids. They just want the rights 
over those who have been involved. I can guarantee you there are schools tonight who are asking for cookies for their teachers tomorrow before the holidays. So maybe sign up and help with things like that. Get involved. As the SAC chair at Rampart, I have invited anybody. You have to be a member to speak, but you're welcome to come and see what actually happens inside a school. Perhaps you can sub, even if it's an hour, three times a month, which is allowed under the sub requirements to help in the cafeteria. I spend every Monday in the SSN room at Rampart in addition to my full-time job. You want parent rights, learn parent involvements first. That is my point with the strategic plan. Um, I just wanna invite anybody who wants to speak parent to parent, I am willing to open that conversation as to how that And that concludes our speakers for this evening. All right, we will be taking a break. It will be in a few minutes. So um, board comments, Ms. Cloninger. You're killing me. I thought we were taking a break right now. I apologize. I'm home sick and uh, still wanted to participate, so I appreciate you bearing with me. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, all of you who spoke. I especially want to thank Cole and Autumn and our student Nathaniel uh, and one other gal at the end. Uh, they were talking about, uh, sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, single mom. Um, I know it's hard to speak in front of a whole crowd. <clears throat> um, I want to acknowledge and share my condolences to the victims and their families of the Club Q shooting. I do not condone that kind of hate and violence aimed at a community I know and love. To my LGBTQIA plus friends and family, I stand beside you and mourn with you. I have spoken so many times from this um, dais about how I will stand for um, all of all of your children and being a mom raising two cisgender male students. Um, I mean that and I just want that to be clear. I don't believe that any of them are a political pawn. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> um, and I don't use them as such. I value the education that they have had here in this district. I um, it it has been, like I said, a week of not feeling well, so I have just a few pictures and if you could help me by putting them up. Um, so I kind of want to point out this to Tiana's point, the last speaker. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, you can see four of us. Um, I was taking the picture, so five. Um, and one other person showed up later. Uh, there were about 30 people in attendance, maybe 25 online, and this is the Parent Academy, which uh, continues to have snow days as their apparent um, issue. <laughs> uh, but this was an incredible um, informational night. Dr. Jesse Hink Hinkley, an excellent presenter, um, from Children's Hospital spoke about the rise of fentanyl and opioid epidemic. Um, I know that these are recorded, so if you would like to go back and listen, they it was an excellent presentation. And my thanks to Maureen Lang and Julie Hendrickson for <clears throat> all that they do um, in these important discussions. Um, most of us were able, the next one, please. Most of us were able to um, go to the 82nd annual CASB convention down at the Broadmoor last week. Our very own Air Academy High School Choir out of the blue under the direction of the always impressive and talented Austina Lee sang the national anthem and made our district proud. They sounded fantastic. Next one. And we'll be discussing a little bit more later in the meeting <clears throat> for those of you who want to hang on for all of that. Um, <clears throat> this is our CASB conference 
um, Colorado Association of School Board. Um, we get to listen to great keynote speakers and network with other board members from all around the state, as well as listen to some very impressive student speakers who came and uh, that's always the the um, areas that I choose to go listen. Finally, <clears throat> my last picture is of the Broadmoor. If you need a little peace after tonight, um, <clears throat> I would say that's a great place to stroll um, and see some pretty lights and um, and recognize that we are all in this great humanity together. And uh, I just want to offer my um, sincere hope that we can find peace and um, that's all. Thank you. Mr. Salt. Thank you. So I'd like to echo Mr. Lavallee's comments and Mr. Ms. Cloninger's comments about the impact that this strategy has had on our community. Um, I have friends, I have coworkers that were deeply impacted by the the tragedy that happened. And so um, my first course of action when I woke up on Sunday morning was to make sure that they were still okay, because I know that that's a, a venue that they frequent and thankfully they were, but they lost several friends during that occasion. And so this is a horrific tragedy and it breaks my heart that this is what is being driven in our community right now. Right before that tragedy, the very day that that happened, I was talking about school safety. I listened to reports from SWAT officers who'd gone into school shootings. I talked to a survivor of Columbine. And so to have those two events happen back to back, I pray that that never happens here, that we do everything. We have a great security team, and I pray that that never happens here. With that being said, I'm really disappointed by our, our community in District 20. This is a time for us to unify around our mission, that people are the heart of our success, and the members of this board sitting at this dais agree with that sentiment completely. Rather than taking this moment to become stronger, I'm appalled that there are those who would use this act of violence against a vulnerable population as a chance to voice their political agendas. This divisive rhetoric is intended to further fracture our community and isolate certain groups. I urge you to dismiss this hateful tact taken here tonight and focus on the hope ahead. Focus on unifying together, reaching across the aisle, being a good neighbor, and moving past these violent acts into a place where we can do what truly matters to this body and this district, which is making sure that every student is thriving emotionally and academically. Thank you. Ms. Cons. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley, and um, I deeply appreciate you honoring the victims that were killed and hurt in the mass shooting and, and letting us um, honor them with a moment of silence. Um, it is shocking and frightening and grievous when a mass shooting occurs, especially in our own city. The senselessness of losing these beloved people is heartbreaking. So where do we go as a community after a tragedy such as this? Do we sow more seeds of strife and fear and anger, or do we choose the higher path, the healing path? Life is fleeting. None of us can control what this monster did, but we can control how we respond to it. I encourage us all to take this tragic loss of life and turn that into positive energy moving forward, into honoring the unique beloved people around us and being the brightest lights possible. Um, I am sorry for Ms. Cloninger being sick that trailed me being sick. So I don't have any pictures at all between our, our Thanksgiving break and um, being in bed last week. But I did attend the um, Parent Academy um, from November 29th online. And Ms. Cloninger actually had a picture 
of the the fact that struck me the hardest that 76 percent of drug deaths are from fentanyl and i actually had a, a nightmare a couple nights ago that my girls and i were taking medicine and all of a sudden as soon as we took it i was like oh my god what if there's fentanyl in it because i hope we're all warning our kids uh every day that it is so prevalent and just to stay away from anything that fentanyl could have been touched. Um, another piece of advice from that um, parent academy that I thought was wonderful overarching advice for any tough conversations we have to have with our children, um, that small, quick and frequent chats with our kids about tough subjects usually are more effective than that one big talk. So I just encourage us for all the tough talks we have to do with our kids, small, frequent, quick, not abrasive, um, just constantly letting them know how much we care about them. Um, I want, I'm glad Mrs. Furry is here because um, she's been working so hard advocating for the safety of our students and staff at Rampart with our parking lot the last few years. And I don't know how she feels, but it's looking better. I know there's a lot of work to do, but as a parent, it's um, flowing. So I'm, I'm thankful to all the work that she's done and the district and the, and the Rampart staff are doing to continue to improve that because it's, it's going better. Um, and lastly, just be best of luck to all of our students with their finals. Um, and if they're not of that age of finals, just with, you know, managing the last week <laughs> um, in schools before our break, and um, best of luck to all of our teachers and staff um, for all the extra effort that these last few weeks demand. So thank you all. Colonel Sullivan. No comments tonight, thank you. Mr. Temby. I'll try to um, truncate some of my comments because um, my colleagues have done a great job recapping some things. First and foremost, my heart goes out to all who were impacted by the Q Club shooting two weeks ago, either directly or indirectly. Every, everyone deserves to feel safe, and this event rocked our community. I don't know what the answer is, but why is the world's greatest experiment in democracy and freedom, our country, far and away the global leader in mass shootings? And I don't have the answer to that question. It was heartwarming to take part in the Bridges program graduation just before this meeting. Kudos to the D20 staff, the parents and guardians of the graduates, and especially the six graduates for a job well done. And very heartwarming. And it just speaks to the excellence in this district. Mr. Lavalley will touch on it in more detail, but the superintendent search is well underway. And uh, please be assured that we are collectively looking uh, for a leader who can perpetuate and enhance the great work being done in this district. As Ms. Kleininger and others have referenced, uh, another great parent academy, thanks to Maureen Lang and uh, uh, the entire team. Uh, it was a very educational program on fentanyl and quite uh, disturbing as referenced. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into I'm not sure if I'm hitting this correctly. There we go. Uh, but uh, another great CASB conference, um, a great networking opportunity, inspirational keynote speakers. At the bottom right, you can see our Air Academy Choir. Uh, they gave a tremendous, beautiful rendition of the, uh, of the national anthem. But to be fair, I do also want to highlight um, from Brand X, Cheyenne Mountain High School's uh, choral group here too, uh, that gave a tremendous performance. Um, I, I could have listened to them all morning. So it's heresy, I know, um, but uh, I do want to reference uh, what great work our uh, students throughout this community are doing. Um, speaking of Air Academy High School, on Tuesday they held their first ever art gala and here's some pictures here and uh, this was really to support all the arts programs that uh, this tremendous high school and just a few pictures from um, this unfortunately i had another engagement so i popped in at the front end but i did not hear the uh, choir and band performance as part of this but the artwork was tremendous a lot of energy and again speaks to the excellence in this district 
lastly, I just added this comment. I don't presume to know each of your hearts. I must state that I am saddened by the attacks on all of my colleagues. No one knows our hearts. We will never advance as a school district as long as we continue to be in a zero sum must win posture. D20 is an excellent place. Let's lead as a district, not follow. A united and not divided board serves everyone and keeps our eyes on excellence. Thank you. Thank you. I had already commented a little bit on that, on just the horrific tragedy of the Club Q shooting. My heart goes out to all the people involved. It, it's a horrific thing. Um, breaks my heart. I, and I, I'm with you. Well, I, I don't understand these mass shootings. I, I just, it, it's it's horrific. And, and I, I, I don't have any answers. I wish I did. Um, and I, I do. <laughs> I hope we can come together. I hope we can come together as a community. Um, I know the hearts of everybody on this board and we want nothing but the best. And I appreciate that. And we have a real high level of trust, even though we don't agree on everything. That's OK. We, we come together and we always assume the best, the, the best motives. And, and I just encourage all of you to assume good motives, even if you disagree with, with what we do, assume good motives that we have. Um, and I think we will get a, be along. We'll, it will really help us out. Uh, Anna, let's talk about some uh, upbeat things. Um, I did attend the CASB convention last week, and I don't have fancy pictures. I do have pictures. Uh, that was our choir. Uh, again, Austina Lee um, led it. It was wonderful. That was the Air Academy High School Choir. They did the national anthem. They were awesome. Um, we will talk more about the uh, convention itself um, in later on in this meeting. Uh, I was able to attend the Mountain Ridge Middle School Spelling Bee on Tuesday, which was really fun. There was a lot of smart kids, um, smarter than me. Some of the, the words, it's like, oh my goodness, I would not have advanced. But uh, it was it, it was great to see competition in academics. And it's, it's not something that we see all that often, but it was really good. And I just really appreciated um, the, the Spelling Bee. It was just well organized and they did a great job. Um, and I got to attend the first annual, uh, the the Air Academy Art Gala. It, it was phenomenal. I got to sit with Dr. Smith, and I'm telling you, this was this was the audience um, side, if you will. And then this was the choir. So there was the choir sang, and they were awesome. There was, in fact, let me just go to the next one. This was the st stringed orchestra. Just stunning, I, in my view. I, I, I'm, I'm a simple man, but I tell you what, they just did, it was just so great. There was a, I'm not going to say skit, but it was a short part of a play that they did. And there was the jazz band. And I've always thought, <laughs> we were talking, jazz band is like, hey, just go play something, you know? But th that's really hard to do. You got to be really good to be able to, to play good jazz. And they they just, just knocked it out of the park. And it was an honor um, it was, I, I, I think it was a first annual, it was at, at the boot barn, but um, it was an honor of uh, Riley Whitelaw. She was the Air Academy High School student and arts lover who was brutally murdered early this year. You know, that one really hit close to home. It was just terrific. And her mom got up and just gave a tremendous speech. I, we were talking, it's like, how, how could she do it? But there was, it would raise money for a scholarship fund in, 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 um, in her honor, in Riley's honor. So it was really just a wonderful evening. Um, and I, I just was, was just so happy to be able to attend that. All right, I want to talk briefly about the superintendent search. We had a couple hour meeting this afternoon, and I'm going to tell you everything that I that we discussed. And I open this up to my my board colleagues um, if I make a mistake, because I, I really didn't take. Now I got to find where we are here. Talk on it. Give me two seconds. There's a lot of paper up here. All right. Um, in December, what we are going to do, uh, we are going to have, first of all, um, Walt Cooper is is the the representative for McPherson and Jacobson that we hired. He is the one who was going to be facilitating most of the focus groups that we have. And in fact, don't expect to see the board 
at those because that's not, we won't be there. It's not because we're lazy. It's because we intentionally don't, don't go to those things. In December, the DAC is going to meet with him. Why only the DAC? Well, they had a meeting scheduled in, in December and that's why. And also he's going to have one-on-one -on -one inter uh, discussions, talks with the Board of Education and with Cabinet. So that's sort of what's going on in December. In January, he's going to be talking to the Patrons Council, which is, you may know, I believe it's over age 65 group, Mr. Gregory, um, that Mr. Gregory wisely created. I think there's 75 members or so. 65. 65. Okay, my apologies. He's going to meet with them. Um, the St Superintendent Student Advisory Council, the Parent Sounding Board, Teacher Communication Council, um, Classified Liaison Group, and then there will be town halls. Uh, if you want to write this down, that's great, but Ms. Cortez will put this all on the Academy website. There is a link to superintendent search. All this stuff will be there. And I, I've said before, and I'm going to say again, I'm going to be as transparent as possible. I'm going to tell you everything we're doing, but don't ask for names. I'm not going to tell you who, because that has to say, stay classified, if you will, until we come out with our finalists. But uh, January 17th and 18th and January 24th and 25th will be open invitation stakeholder town halls. There's, there should be four of them, and that will occur and anybody can attend. And there will also be a uh, a survey that will be done and and so you you in fact we're, we're making sure that it's it's one computer per one one survey per computer we don't want people to try to you know do multiple surveys but um but that's going to happen as well all right briefly i want to I talk just a, just a couple of um little timelines here uh march and make sure i get this right march 1st is the day we're going to meet an executive session and we're going to start narrowing down. It's and and again, that's an executive session. Just FYI, um, the the board meeting. Let's see, and I got to look at this on March sixteenth. Y'all help me out here. Um, sorry, I got to pull this up again. I'm I'm just kind of doing this on the fly because we just met, and I want to give you all updates as soon as I can. The board meeting on March sixteenth. Um, we are going to move the time up an hour. We are not going to have public comments at that meeting. You may think, oh no, we're it's only because the finalists will be there at the board meeting to speak and it's going to take a fair amount of time. In fact, we're even moving up the spotlight. We're moving up the board meeting. It's going to be a pretty long night. So I'm just telling you in advance, we all agreed on the March 16th board meeting, there will not be public comments, but the, the number of, we don't know how many finalists there will be, but those finalists will be in attendance. And then we will vote for the finalist on April 6th, that is the board meeting. You will find out, hopefully not before, but you will find out on April 6th. Again, is that absolutely in stone? No, not necessarily, but probably. That's the plan, is on the April 6th meeting, we will announce the new superintendent. Board, did I miss anything? Okay. Um, Mr. Gregory, administrative comments. Yes, thank you. Take a few minutes to focus on some students. Um, congratulations to Jamie. Kazir of Air Academy High School. During the fall break, she performed at the annual Macy's Day Thanksgiving Day Parade. You may remember that Jamie was the only student in Colorado to win this honor after she submitted an audition last year, so she was selected. While in New York City, Jamie played her flute among hundreds of other high schoolers uh, and even played rock, paper, scissors with late night talk show host Jimmy Fallon, which may have been the highlight, I suppose, of the whole, whole week for her, but uh, this weekend, the Festival of, of Lights Parade was filled with Academy District 20 performers. If you were there, you uh, witnessed band members from Air Academy High School, Liberty High School, and Timberview Middle School who all took part in the parade this year. The Pine Creek High School Jazz Combo Band is taking its talents on the road. Last week, the combo performed at the Grainer Music Hall here in Colorado Springs. They played a few songs, including Sunny Side of, Sunny Side of the Street and Just the Two of Us. Um, Rampart High School was awarded the top fundraising school for the current school year by the Leukemia and Lymphoma, Lymph Lymphoma Society. This award came from the school's Bald for Bucks fundraiser last spring. Uh, in total, Rampart and nine other District 20 schools helped raise more than $44,000 that will fund treatments for patients suffering from all forms of blood cancers. If you've never, I will just put out the invitation now. If you've never participated in the Bald for Bucks assembly in the fall of Rampart, please 
uh, even if you don't want to get your hair cut, it's still a good event to 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 go to attend and 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 see the the enormity I'll call it of it. Uh, and if you want your hair cut and make a donation, that's that's good too. Uh, Rampart alumni Kyra Parker, who graduated in 2018, is making headlines for groundbreaking groundbreaking research she's doing while pursuing her doc doctoral degree. Kyra is working on identifying neuronal signaling pathways. She hopes to discover how a protein in our body can influence fetal neurodevelopment when a mother exercises. Learning more about the protein will help expecting mothers who can't exercise. Best to Kyra, because I can't even say it. Uh, and lastly, congratulations to Dana Coe of Pine Creek High School. This is really significant uh, as a parent. Uh, I see the significance of this for many reasons, but you'll find out mainly the, the, the main one in just a second. Uh, congratulations to Dana Coe of Pine Creek High School for being selected as one of only two students in Colorado to represent the state as a delegate to the United States Sen Senate Youth Program. And if you want to Google that, it's the you can just Google USSYP. Uh, it's to be held March 4th through 11th uh, this spring uh, in DC. Uh, Dana also receives a $10,000 scholarship for college. Each year, two of the highest achieving students from each state and the District of Columbia and the Department of Defense Education System overseas are selected through a competitive merit-based selection process held at the State Departments of Education nationwide. So congratulations to Dana, and at this point, I would also say probably to Dana's parents um, for that award and scholarship. And since this is the last time we'll see everyone before December 31st, a happy holidays to everyone, and I know it sounds odd, but happy new year. Thank you, that's all I have, Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. We're down to 67 attendees. The consent agenda, we need a motion to approve the following resolutions. Resolution 317-22, approval of matters relating to staff, specialist staff. Resolution 318-22, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. Resolution 319, 22 approval of matters relating to licensed staff, licensed support slash special services provider. Resolution 320-22, approval of matters relating to classified staff. Resolutions 321-22, approval of addendum to superintendent employment contract. And uh, finally, approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from November 17th, 2022. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Mr. Temby. Aye. Remind me when we come back, board, I forgot to do the MRE for ENDS 1.1. We'll do that after we take a 10 minute break.
All right, folks. Andy, can you? All right, ladies and gentlemen, please get uh, take your seats. We're going to get started. All right, board, we need to do the MRE for ENDS 1.1, Knowledge and Skills. Is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance or concerns regarding performance? Would you like to see additional or different evidence or should any part of this policy be changed in the next monitoring report cycle? Do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? Thank you. Um, just just a comment um, in terms of exemplary performance. Um, I think the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, it just, it's, it's incredible that we are rebounding. We, we are not where we need to be, but we are rebounding. Uh, I would submit at a pace greater than many districts. How about if we say, because I thought the same thing, how about if we say the board is very pleased with our progress so far? Is that fair? I also wanted to just again appreciate the additional commentary, the stories about how that was working yeah. and how they're implementing these creative solutions. And so please keep that for next time. I concur. So you can put that in there if that's okay. All right. New course proposals. Mr. Gregory, did I miss something? You scared me. Mr. Gregory. Yeah, Dr. Field, please. Yes, good evening, board. It's my pleasure to introduce Casey Killingsworth, our Director for Curriculum and Instruction. It is my pleasure to represent the new course proposal process for Academy District 20. I want to start off by thanking all of the administrators and teachers who took a lot of time and effort to um, develop these courses to support our students and the programming within our schools. So just a little reminder of how the process works. Um, we follow um, administrative policy IIACE3 around new course proposals. And really schools um, take it upon themselves each year to look at their current courses and programs and solicit feedback from students on interests and passions and they determine what courses would be ones that they want to put forward for a new course for the following school year. Um, and then once those new course proposals are developed, um, they come to curriculum instruction and we take a look at those and as you can see in your board packet, they include the title, the, the content, the credit amount, how long it is, et cetera, the description. And then this year we tried to help um, make it a little bit more consistent where we gave them a example format of how they could put their standards, targets, objectives, et cetera. Um, and that's a real useful piece because once a, a course is adopted, um, even if Village submits that course, any school can offer that course. So it allows the other schools to see the exact intent behind that course. Um, so once curriculum instruction has reviewed them, asked questions, kind of cleaned them up a little bit to make them um, uniform, if you will, I take them before the learning service lead team, which is led by Dr. Susan Field, um, and then all the directors of the different departments and learning services. And I present those courses um, and they get an opportunity to ask questions, um, make comments, and then I take those back to the schools. And then we finalize those new course proposals into what you have in your board packet. Um, and so that is the process for courses that have to be approved by you. We also have a process for courses that are submitted to us that don't necessarily need board approval. So they're a part of an existing program like Project Lead the Way, or last year you approved the secondary pathways, um, CTE pathways, which is why the drone course doesn't come before the board. That's a part of the 
um, College Pathways courses that are already approved. So with that being said, we have two schools who have proposed courses um, for your consideration for approval tonight. Um, and we have Pine Creek High School, who is represented by, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Assistant Principal Kathleen Raphael, and they are proposing the course Meteorology. And then Village High School, um, represented by Principal Nathan Gorsh, um, and they are proposing uh, several classes. They're proposing Global Fluency Awareness, Global Fluency Skills, Global Fluency Capstone, Nutrition and Food Science, and Science of Angling, Fishing in Colorado. So at this point, I know you've had an opportunity to read the packets. Might you have any questions that administrators or myself can answer? Mr. Tembe. A uh, question for both Pine Creek and for the village. Um, can you just talk about what germinated uh, the ideas for these classes? You know, um, candidly, I loved them all. Um, I, I think they're great additions, whether they be a part of the core or an elective. Um, but uh, it just, again, speaks to the breadth and greatness of this district. So if you could just talk about what germinated the idea, um, was there an epiphany or how, how did these come about? Yeah, so uh, I'll speak to our courses. Um, I told Kathleen she should go first and she said, no way. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so these, we every year we start to talk about the courses we might offer in the future and really open it to staff and talk about this um, process and and allow them to kind of dream and and then it's fun they talk to students about what students might be interested in um, the global fluency really comes from um, we had some conversations with a group out of Ohio um, really kind of fascinating to get kids thinking about impacts throughout the world of decisions that are made and um, and what they can do about it kind of in a problem solving sort of a scenario and inquiry idea um, so that's where that one came from um, the nutrition and food science, uh, one of our teachers is very, on a personal level, very into that. Um, and we have some programs approved for like um, concurrent enrollment or uh, a vocational type of look or CTE class, but we didn't have just a, I wanna explore this and I wanna learn about it. Um, and so that's why she proposed that. Um, and then the, the science of angling, we offer an outdoor fitness class and our students do a lot of fly fishing. Um, and they started playing around with the entomology and figuring out you know, there's actually real science to it. What are the uh, what are the fish eating? How do the different phases of the insects affect that? And uh, one of our science teachers said, I would love to team teach that. Um, and so that one emerged out of those conversations. So similarly, we kind of talked amongst ourselves and then with kiddos as well about um, different really we were looking at science classes. So different ways that we could approach science in an authentic real world application, still have it be lab based, um, different ways for students to be able to get that science lab based credit and, and experience. So we're actually gonna be offering a few more, but they were already in the course master. They're already courses that are being offered somewhere in D20 high schools. This was the only one that was new and different. And so we, are proposing this one. Well, I'm going to enroll in both schools and attend these classes. I was going to ask if I could audit the meteorology class, to be honest with you. As an, a pilot, I'm a weather geek, and, and I, I know some, but I would, anyways, I think it's great. And I got to confess, Mr. Gorsh, when I first saw the science of angling fishing, I rolled my eyes and I thought, oh, please, <sighs> give me a break. But then I looked and I went, okay, you're talking about hatching and you're talking about wildlife and you're talking about habitat. I thought, okay, yeah, that's doable. Uh, so I, I, I support them all. Uh, Mr. Salt. Thank you. Uh, so the, the one question I apologize I didn't send this ahead of time was, um, do we, are there textbooks? I saw with the meteorology or? No, there are no textbooks. It's all going to be taken off of um, what we can get freely off of the internet and um, through the sources that we already have at school. And we will not be using textbooks for any of our, our courses either. And in response to Mr. Timby, I can't help but think of Billy Madison and I picture you returning to high school and it warms my heart. <laughs> um, 
Mr. Gorsh has already uh, reserved a spot in the science of angling class for me. <laughs> uh, and I might be taking that to my employer and saying, I think we need to pursue some of this as well. But no, I think these are professional learning. Um, no, I appreciate this and, and really the opportunities that this is going to present to our students. Um, you know, I, I worked with people from around the, the globe. And so having this global fluency course, I think is going to be very critical. I think especially I think it works so well with your particular model coming out that uh, I'm really excited about what this is going to offer for your students. So uh, thank you all for for putting this forward and I'm really excited about these. I'm going to go Miss Cloninger next. Thank you. Um, I just want to point out that both of these schools are my schools and I have nothing to do with that, but I do appreciate um, both of you um, presenting these. I think that um, I don't I, because I can't see into the room right now. I don't know how many people have stayed, but this is where it is. This is where the work gets done, and I'm grateful to people like you and to the dedication you have to your students to going and thinking outside the box and and making these things happen. It is phenomenal, and I think that we have great educators here. Ms. Kahn's. Yeah, this it's so exciting to see these course offerings, and um, I think it's what gets our students, you know, our secondary students excited about career and future. So just, you know, a lot of them are science based and it's just really fun that you've found those niches and and the students get to benefit from that. And when my brother was in high school, he took snowboarding as his PE, so I fully support fishing and angling. <laughs> But thank you for for all this work and putting the proposals together and for for streamlining and you know getting the the format. It really did help read it. So thank you, Mr. Gregory. It just real quick some foundational things because I think it's important for everybody to know too is is the how uh, you know how is this how does this fit right or what does this kick out now right what can a student not do so I just want to go back several years and give credit to the high school principals. Uh, and Dr. Smith, I don't know how many years ago, but several years ago will suffice. Uh, when they went from a seven period day to eight period day, you can do the math right there. What they do that created uh, one more class each semester that a student could take. So these now become opportunities that uh, students don't have to maybe choose A or B. Uh, they can do both A or B because now it's an eight period schedule um, for two semesters a year for for four years, so that's part of it. And then just quickly, since I meant to and I did not during uh, my comments, uh, you should know that uh, Mr. Gorsh hosted uh, folks from the State Board of Education and CDE today at the Village because they wanted to take a look at how that works. Don't want to change the subject, just, just thought you guys should know. Um, and he did a very good job and they spent a lot of time. So thank you, Mr. Gorsh. Thanks. Thank you all. And Mr. Gorsh, next time I see you offline, remind me I will tell you my fly fishing story. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Uh, oh, Colonel Sullivan, I'm sorry. Oh, nothing. Okay. <laughs> all right. The next is the monitor report for executive limitation policy EL 2.4 financial condition and activities. Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Allen, please. Good evening. I think I have the next three reports, so I apologize in advance. All right, EL 2.4. As you know, this is executive limitation uh, 2.4 for financial conditions and activities. The period that we're looking at is November 22nd of 2021 through November 21st of this year. If you please turn to page one of the report, PDF page one, you'll see the Executive Limitations 2.4 language along with the 12 policy provision statements that comprise this EL. And in summary, uh, these require the superintendent to not spend more funds than received unless you really have board approval, indebt the district by more than what can be repaid within 60 days, again, unless there's board approval, spend more than $100,000 from the unassigned fund balance without board approval, transfer dollars from one fund to another without that approval, 
fail to settle payroll, vendor, and bond obligations in a timely manner, commit to a single non-budgeted expenditure above $100,000 unless there's an emergency, allow splitting, fail to ensure that purchases are prudent and sound, allow purchases to differ from spending limits, allow federal or state reports to be filed inaccurately or late. Uh, we cannot have controls that don't comply with uh, GAAP or GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, and we are re required to maintain accurate and complete financial records. The report is organized so that each of the 12 policy provision statements are outlined with definitions of terms and different data to explain that those provisions, uh, how they are met. I'd like to please just draw your attention to EL 2.4.7, which is on PDF page five, and it has the page number four at the bottom. This indicates that the superintendent will not allow splitting. Splitting refers to trying to avoid a purchasing threshold. Let's say I wanna buy something that's worth $12,000, and I just use my purchasing card. I really don't get any other types of comparative pricing. And I say, oh, over 10,000, there's more steps I have to take. So I go through the line twice with a $6,000 purchase and then another $6,000 purchase. That's an example of splitting. So we are not allowed to do that. However, I do wanna share with you that back in August, um, one of our schools, there was a staff member, there are different purchasing cards with different limits. One limit might be a $250 card maybe a $500 card, a $1,000 card. So this individual took a card that was too small really and ended up using it twice to make a purchase of about $371 total. They did not exceed a purchasing threshold, but we also want schools to use the appropriate purchasing tool. So certainly we work with the principal to talk about how to avoid that in the future. I don't really see that as violating the EL policy provision statement because they didn't try to circumnavigate um, the actual thresholds. That also happened at a different school in September, so I wanted to make sure that you knew that within the body of this EL. Um, again, because of the nature, we're still, I, I think the superintendent is still in compliance with that particular policy provision statement. So, in summary, as detailed in the report, I'm reporting compliance with 12 of the 12 policy provision statements. Any questions for me? Mr. Temme. Just a comment. <clears throat> we take our fiduciary responsibility for granted here. Um, uh, this district has had a long history of uh, managing its resources well, being compliant, particularly in this area and appreciate um, our, uh, our lineage here with uh, Superintendent Gregory and now um, uh, Ms. Allen. Um, you've done a phenomenal job. So really appreciate that it, it helps the board immensely. So my only comment was no offense. This was a very boring report, which is exactly what you want That's when you right. start talking finances. You want low excitement in That's, finance. Yep, That's and, right. and I appreciated that. So we are being fiscally responsible, which allows us to have boring um, reports like this. Mr. Salt. I just wanted to thank you for the disclosure and the explanation around uh, that splitting piece. Um, I, I agree with you that it, it although it was a split expense, did not violate the the spirit of the policy with the the thresholds that were on there. But I appreciate the disclosure and letting us know. Um, as everyone said, I really appreciate the work that you and your your team do. Thank you. Thank you, Miss um, Cons. Just real quick to reiterate, um, reading this report just made me grateful for all the moving pieces of everyone on staff here that we do speak about the you know that we're things are prefaced ahead of time, we're prepared, we're in compliance with voting and with it just, you know, the whole process that I've seen over the year, I'm just, I'm grateful that everyone is working together to achieve this compliance, so thank you. Thank you, and I truly give the credit to my team um, in business services, they truly do an amazing job, so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allen. MRE. Is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? 
are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance or concerns regarding performance. Would you like to see additional or different evidence or should any part of this policy be changed in the next report cycle? Would, do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? Very good. Next one is the, we need a motion to approve resolution 322-22 approval of certification, certification, no certification, of the official October funded pupil count for 22-23, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Ms. Allen again, please. All right, thank you. Yeah, we need, forgive me, let's do a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Discussion, Mr. Gregory, and then back to you, Ms. Allen. Thank you. And if you don't mind just showing that PowerPoint, you can just start with slide two if that's okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So each school district in the state of Colorado must report their pupil count data for October 1st. This year, October 1st fell on a Saturday, so our count date was Monday, October 3rd. And this pupil count and our what's called FTE or full-time equivalent count is very critical uh, to our budgeting because that is one of the big variables that determines how much funding and operational revenue the school district receives. So the resolution before you this evening would approve this year's pupil counts of 26,607 for headcount and full-time equivalent of 25,613. What I am showing you on the slide is something that I just think is important to give us context over these last several years that have been uh, not typical. So if you take a look on that left part of your screen, the, the red column there, that represents the October count for 1920. So at the time that we had that count, maybe we heard a little bit of COVID on the news overseas, but this was really not part of our world. It wasn't until that March that we had our shutdown. So I consider this pre-COVID types of headcounts. And of course, we know that we had volatile decreases in our enrollment for the next two years. And what I am so pleased to see is that when you look at the headcount for this year in pink, all the way off to the right for 22-23, we have now exceeded where we were by four students. So it means it's taken us several years, but we really have gotten back to, to our level pre-COVID, which is an exciting piece. It speaks a lot about the progress that, that our whole community has made past that time. I also want to note to the far right, you have a box there that shows our projection, and you can see we exceeded our projection by about 115 students. So that is also a good news story. The next two slides I just would like to show, I think they probably will not be as relevant after this year, but just another contextual piece to show you the change that we've seen over the last several years. What you see uh, in those three clusters, the far left is Journey K-8, but it's just K-5. In the middle, you see Journey K-8 for 6-8, and then off to the right, you see Village High School. And this is an indication to really see the trend of what happened with our what we call COVID only online enrollments. When you look at the leftmost portion of your screen, you see the K-5 piece and you see 48 in that pre-COVID year and then it just exploded. It went so high my graph couldn't touch it. If that green column, it would poke out the ceiling because we had uh, almost 1,800 students accessing that, that online only. And you can see the recovery since. Same thing for the middle school grades at Journey. And then we had a brief time in that blue column for Village High School where we had some specific only online enrollments. But we are certainly, again, back to what we would consider typical pre-COVID. You might be wondering, well, Becky, I disagree with you with Village High School. But if Nathan were still here, I would remind you that uh, with the new space that he occupies, this is about the maximum that he can have. And because he has such an interest, um, he doesn't have a problem certainly uh, filling to capacity. The one last slide that I just wanted to show you gives us a glimpse of our home-based enrollments. And again, those green years show that there was a spike in that choice by families. And we certainly have seen recovery over over time. 
Do you have any questions for me? I um, <clears throat> just a just a comment. All of our withdrawals are higher than pre-COVID, not much, yes. um, but the elementary is is still quite a bit higher. Uh, any thoughts as to why? I mean, I know we're all speculating, but probably two thoughts. One thing that I learned today that I did not know in the past: the data in red it excludes what they call no-show students. A no-show student means they're enrolled in the school district but they've never set foot in a classroom in our district and then their family disenrolls. That was not included in those red years. The system in Central Registry changed and after that, no-shows are included. So I just did a little bit of math for the elementary um, and if, if I were to use the same methodology on that 223 pink for elementary, it would be 136. So it still has, though, a wider gap than the other two levels. Um, the other with that same trick, the 80 for middle would have been 66, so a, a smidge higher. And then for high, it would have been 35, so a tiny bit lower. So we still see the larger gap, though, at elementary. I think that um, typically, we see higher numbers of home-based home education at elementary. I think the fact that kindergarten is not required, uh, those are my best guesses is why we continue to see that gap a little wider. Fair enough. And is this home-based or is this maybe going to a private school or going to a, a BOCI school or something, or is this purely people homeschooling? It would be a parent who tells us over the, you know, informs us, I'm going to homeschool my student. Now, if they end up enrolling that student in a private school and don't tell us, it would be recorded as home-based. Okay. Board, any other questions? Thank you. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. We now need a motion to approve resolution 323-22 approval of mill levy certification for calendar year 2023 collection. So moved. Second. Mr. Gregory. Ms. Allen again, please. All right. And we'll go ahead with this. <coughs> okay. Good evening. School districts again, of course, are required by law to certify the tax levy to their county treasurer and CDE by December 15th each year. So this levy certi certification will help us achieve that goal. In November 1999 and in, no, uh, excuse me, November of 2008, uh, we had various ballot measures uh, related to mill levy overrides. In November of 1999, part of that was a voter established uh, vote of confidence that the Academy District 20 Board of Education may not certify a levy in excess of 60.216 mills. We refer to that really as a cap. Another way of saying it is District 20 voters said, Academy District 20, if you can stay at 60.216 or below, you are living within your means, and we support you to do that. District 20 has honored this commitment and will continue to live within our means of 60.216. And in fact, this evening, I'll recommend mill levies to certify for each part of the overall mill levy, and we will continue as we started last year being beneath the cap of 60.216. Now, there are two big steps in determining how you, how you levy these particular amounts for our our property owners in District 20. The first big step relates to our district's assessed valuation. I'm going to nickname it AV, okay? Assessed valuation is AV. And it's important to note that the mill levy we are discussing this evening applies to property assessments for calendar year 2022. So we've got a few more weeks. Then that's also referred to as collection year 2023 because that's when El Paso County will collect those property tax payments. So this slide shows a snippet of a chart that's on page seven that's attached to this board item, and it provides a historical look at our assessed valuations over the years. And what you can see in the upper left-hand column of that chart is you see the green and the pink, 
That is referring to this year's assessed valuation. And what you'll see in green is that our assessed valuation comes with parts to it. We have total assessed value for vacant land and then residential, commercial, industrial, and other properties. We also then take what's called a TIF. It's a tax increment financing, and that is something that gets deducted. You can see that there in uh, just in sandwiched in between the pink and the yellow. We end up then what's in yellow, which is referred to as our net assessed valuation or our net AV, our big AV number. And you can see that that number is over $2.2 billion. Now, it's important to note that this AV, that $2.2 billion in the yellow box, is about 1.65% higher than last year. And you can see that percentage if you look just to the right of that yellow box. And if you let your eyes keep going across that chart to the right, you'll see other percentages. You'll see over 18%, then it'll go back down, then another high amount. That's because every other year is a reassessment year. Even numbered years, not a reassessment year. That's 2022, 2020, 2018. When you look at those change numbers, they are all gonna be lower. There's less change when it's a non-reassessment year. When it's an odd numbered year, 2021, 2019, that's a reassessment year. That's where you start to see those jumps. So that's the reason and that pattern really continues over time. That's now, across all of Colorado. That's not local. That's that's, that's right. That's right. It pertains to every every taxing jurisdiction in Colorado. Yes. Now, before I get to the second slide and show the exact levies that I'm recommending for you to consider tonight, I want to talk about just one other thing, because this has a direct impact on all anyone who's a property owner, which is the residential assessment rate. So what you see at the very bottom of this screen, I highlighted something in light blue. And so you could read along as I kind of talk about this. But in 2017 and 2018, the residential assessment rate was 7.2%. And that has declined over time with the Gallagher Amendment starting in 1982, it was over 20%. And it has declined. We know that the Gallagher Amendment was repealed uh, several years ago. And where we are now is 7.5% was last year, 2020 and 2021 but that residential assessment rate has fallen again. So in 2021, Colorado initiated a Senate bill to temporarily re reduce the residential assessment rate to 6.95%. So that's what we have right now. There's another Senate bill that lowers it again temporarily for next year to 6.765. What it does in 2024 and beyond, don't know yet. We'll have to wait and see. So that, that is, is fluctuating right now, and we'll see where things stand in another two years. Thank you. Can I interrupt just, just to add something? Because I think it's important for our community. Um, I, I believe, well, I know that the PPRTA passed on the last, this mm -hmm. in November, right? And I think it was like 80, 20, some huge numbers. That's not disassociated from what's on this paper. Uh, because the first, if you remember the list of projects on the PPRTA ballot question, the first one of the first two, I think the top three projects at least was the extension of powers to I-25. Well, know also that this red line across here that says less TIF increment, um, part of our property tax uh, is carved off that goes to fund the TIF and this TIF is uh, if you looked at a boundary is essentially think of the Bass Pro area, all of that development from from when it was cattle grazing land to what it is today. There's a component of that. Any of the incremental growth in value, once all those things are built, is part of this tax increment. What's important about this is you'll see on here $35 million. There's another one in our district, but I think it's so small that it's not going to impact this. But if you add that 35 million, then look the year before, 29 million, the year before that, 26, the year before that, 25, the year before that, 22, 
all of those dollars go to help fund that powers extension, public improvements um, around that property. So I think what's important to our community to know is, yes, the PPRTA is a piece of it, um, but there is money that goes to fund public improvements uh, from that TIF. And in this case, the public improvements were defined as extending powers. Uh, now, part of that was probably also already expended on the the whole interchange system with I-25 that happened. Um, so I'm not saying all these dollars are available because I'm sure that uh, I haven't looked at the financials from the TIF, but uh, it's just important to know, I think, for our community that that part was a TIF and it still has, they're like 20 years long, so there's still some time left on it. Um, but I think it's an important because of the PPRTA piece and powers, the extension of powers is Directly pretty forward. vital to our community and, and moving around inside of our community. And some of that funding comes from, from our property tax also. I was going to ask, um, related to that item, what are the other areas that are inside of that TIF boundary? Is it just the Bass Pro? And I know we have the other one with the... True North. It, it goes to, um, so just the Bass Pro area. So just if you can picture in your mind an aerial view of that. So Sprouts, think to the east. Um, essentially, I'll end it at the, can't remember that housing development right there, but... Um, like Greyhawk area. Greyhawk. So essentially the Sprouts and that strip mall, Ace Hardware, all that, from there west mm -hmm. to I-25. So ev all of that development inside of there, um, I believe the loaf and jug that's over there, all of that is inside of this TIF. The other TIF that is relatively new is across I-25, and that's- um, True North. The True North, mm -hmm. the Air Force Academy Visitor Center, that's federal property, but uh, that's a second TIF that those numbers would be embedded in here, but I don't think enough has, next year you'll see the impact of that. Um, there's just not enough that's happened. Uh, I don't think that's that's really gonna impact uh, the value. Most of this $35 million here is from that, what we call the Bass Pro area, but it's really, it extends beyond it a little bit. You don't, don't happen to remember what year that was allocated to you? I do. We have it. Um, Becky's got I a whole can, notebook. I know that I left I, I in her office. I can get it for so, you tomorrow, um, an email, if that's okay. That would be perfect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I want to say we're more than, I want to say it was like 9, 10. I, I was going to so guess 10, but I just about wanted... about half, a little, maybe over halfway through it. So I know a lot of the ones that we're seeing, um, or that I've been presented with is 25, so I'm assuming that's probably similar. So we're... Yes. Okay, thank you. So what I take from this slide is that AV number. That's the big takeaway. So now let's go to the specific levies that, that I am recommending for this evening. Sorry, and Becky, can you go back one slide again? Sure. <clears throat> just because there's, uh, I'm just going to throw out an assumption that 90% plus of our community doesn't understand what a mill is. So in our district, uh, that 2.25 2.225 billion dollar number on there for every mill that you guys certify right it's going to generate 2.225 million dollars so that's what a mill is so when becky says 50 mills or 20 mills or whatever the number might be it's against our av so for every one mill right when you multiply it times that it's going to produce or generate 2.2 million dollars. That's what a mill is. So what you see on this slide is a, li a list of the four types of levies that we have, and I've intentionally numbered them one, two, three, four, because it will just be easy for us to talk about it here without me being up at a board, being able to point to things. You'll see under that column with the star that that says CY 2023, that's collection year. That's the one 2023 that I'm recommending for this evening. To the right of that, you'll see last year's rate and all the way to the right, you'll see the change. So let's start to just talk about um, what stands out to me right off the bat. So as we know, 60.216 is our cap. That's our live within our means cap, if you will. You can see last year at 56.507 mills, we went ahead and we were several mills below our means. 
Why did that happen? Well, as you start to get a bigger and bigger AV, that mill that Mr. Gregory talked about gets bigger. Here's the easiest way, and you know I have silly analogies, so please forgive me, but this was one of the ways that helped me learn it. And you know I like pizza, right? And we're coming up where I get to go back to New Jersey soon, so I'll call it a tomato pie. All right, so if I am hungry and you invite me over and you've ordered a small pizza and a large pizza, now, everywhere where I get pizza, it's eight slices, right? No matter how small or big the pie is. So if I'm hungry, I've got a small pizza, large pizza, and you say, Becky, you can have one slice. I'm going to go over to the larger pizza and take my slice from that. It's still one slice. I could have taken one slice from the small, but one slice, one slice, this one's bigger. Same for assess valuation. As our AV gets bigger, one mil generates more dollars because I'm taking a slice and because the whole thing is already bigger, just like that bigger slice of one pizza, I'm gonna get more out of it. So why do we start to fall below the 60.216? Because now a mil, as that AV last year grew eight, over 18%, that's very large. I just got a real big pizza. So when I take a slice, it's a pretty big slice. So it cost me less mills last year to fund all of the levies that you see there. And what you can see to the left of it in the blue box, you will see an even smaller amount this year because we've still had some increase in our AV. It was only the 1.65%. But again, it's taking us fewer mills to fund all of the levies that we need. So let's go ahead and take a look at, at these different levies. The top one in red is an easy one. It is 27 mils by state law. I can't adjust it. So we are, that's our part of total program funding that we tell the state that we're going to take care of. Some other school districts are still working to meet the law and get to 27 mils because they've, they can only increase one mil at a time if they're below that, but we are there. So we're satisfied there. And that green number that I just made show up on the left under revenue tells you that that will generate about $60 million. Number two is the abatement levy. We, uh, the county gives us a number of an estimate of the types of revenue that we may be entitled to but won't collect. Maybe properties that are removed from the tax roll or something's overvalued and for whatever reason, we're not going to quite collect everything we, we needed to. And so they give us that dollar amount. The dollar amount, whoops, is the 585, 348. To get there, that's the mills, the 0.263. The next one is number three. This is our mill levy overrides. I mentioned earlier, November 1999, and uh, 2008 as well, we had two mill levy override ballot measures that both passed. And they were both flat dollar amounts. One of them is 12,750,862, dollars and the other one is 14 million. So that total is 26,750,862. dollars Another silly analogy, but it helps me understand. Y'all have seen the showcase showdown at the Price is Right. You want to bid as close as you can without going over. That's what I do as well. I levy as much as I can without breaching that total of 26,750,862. And so you can see that it's, it's, a, it's a total of 12.019. And you can see that dollar amount. See, I'm just underneath it. Couldn't let levy any fraction of a mill more or I'd be out of compliance with the voter uh, approved mill levy pieces. Now, it's very important to also note here that this amount that we're collecting, 26,750,161, represents about 11.6% of our total program revenue. Why do I even say that? Statute says we can only have a mill levy override up to 25%. You can see we're way down at 11.6. There's quite a bit of room there where we could continue to uh, request 
to voters, do you want to consider a mail levy override? That's the gap that's there. We're at 11.6. We can go all the way up to 25%. The last component, number four, is our bond redemption levy. This is the levy that we set. The money that we collect pays our, just almost like you would pay your mortgage payment and interest. So when we sold bonds from the $230 million in 2016 and some bonds before that, we have principal payments each year and interest payments each year. So the levy that we set collects the money necessary to pay those bills on an annual basis. And you can see that we're levying this one at 13.748. And if you'll notice, except for the 27 mills, all of the mills are lower than they were last year. So in summary, and if I just go like that, what you can see is the total amount being generated is about 118 million. And notice again, less dollars than what we collected last year. So again, in summary, the sum is a 53.030, which is over seven mils under our live within your means amount of 60.216 and almost three and a half mils lower than last year's total levy. This is certainly good news for our taxpayers. There's no question about it. However, I will tell you that having a levy that's significantly below that live within our means cap does bring a challenge. And it ties to some of the mill levy override conversations that we've had over the last year. Now, when voters approved the mill levy overrides for District 20 in 1999 and 2008, I wanna point out something pretty important. They were fixed dollar amounts. Forever and ever, it's 12,750,862. And forever and ever, it's 14 million. So think about as time goes by, inflation happens, buying power goes down, salary adjustments, cost of living, and those dollar amounts stay fixed. And because our AV goes up, the mills go down. That's what creates that room for us to explore things like a mill levy override. The alternative to that is not setting a fixed dollar amount and is saying, voters, would you please allow us to, to have a mill levy override up to eight mills? Well, that's what we sometimes refer to as more of a blank check option. Because eight mills this year, making these numbers up, maybe that garners 15 million. Then the AV goes up. That amount of mills, 18 million. As long as, you live, as long as you live in an area where the AV is continuing to go up and not grow stagnant, the amount keeps growing. That is why in our mill levy uh, MLO conversations, we always recommend a fixed amount so our voters know exactly what that dollar amount is and that we're held to that even over time. So again, for us, we're living below our means while relying on that annual MLO amount. And to your support, we're so pleased that we've been able to get our teachers to a starting salary of $45,000 this year. However, again, with inflation, staffing shortages, trying to be competitive in the area, maintaining our facilities, money just simply doesn't go as far as it used to. And that's why we began to explore that mill levy override for a fixed dollar amount. So as we move forward, um, if this is a conversation that continues, Please know there is room there to explore. I would continue to recommend a fixed dollar amount because it is most transparent to our voters. And it truly would still, even if we looked at something like that, we would never breach the 60.216 mills because that is our commitment to our community. And in fact, even to look at a mill levy override doesn't mean we'd have to go to 60.216 mills all at once. So as we had that conversation, I just wanted to bring some context how this connects to some of the conversations that have already occurred. Do you have any questions for me? Mr. Timmy. Uh, Ms. Allen, can you talk about, quickly, <laughs> can, you, can you talk about local share, state share, and the Budget Stabilization Act as it relates to all this? Yes. So... We, and I'm going to use the bucket analogy because that's the easiest one for me to talk about. So each school district has its own total program funding amount. And it's that per pupil revenue that sets it. 
And as you know, there are different factors that go into that amount. District 20, despite being at the top, Dr. Field and her team did a great job showing you about the academic excellence with respect to achievement and growth and opportunities for students that we have at the top. We're 177 out of 178 when we talk about funding level in the state, which to me shocked me when I first knew that. Because what, we, what our staff, our kids, and our families accomplish, it's not due to high levels of money. It's due to making the best of the resources that we have and giving every day our best. So if I were in a gymnasium with 177 other CFOs, I'd have the District 20 bucket. And what happens is all of our property taxes, imagine it blue sand, we're blue in District 20, right? So all those property taxes, that 60 million up on the screen, I pour all the sand in there. And at the top of the bucket, the state, well, I'm gonna still stick with the Denver Broncos and say that the state's sand is orange. And the orange comes and fills it up to the top and you smooth off the bucket. But that part's not true. Everything's true until the sand goes to the top of the bucket. The state doesn't have enough orange sand to go around and fill all the school district's budget buckets. So all buckets have a little gap at the top that's not always so little. It's called the budget stabilization factor. Last year for us, it was $15.6 million. That's dollars we didn't get. That's huge. Last year, using last year's numbers, it was about 1.6 million to do 1% salary. So that's almost 10%. The year before in COVID, when we really had difficult budget times, it was $32 million. So that budget stabilization factor is something that is the biggest challenge that we have. If our state can work to reduce that, we will start to see our funding increase. Now, one of the other questions that I get a lot, people call me, especially it's coming up when those property tax statements go out. I always get a few calls. They ask me what, how you set these amounts. I say, it's hard. They say, Miss Allen, I, I don't know where you're coming from. I just drove down Powers, it's booming. I went to Great Wolf Lodge, I went to Shields. I went, what are you talking about? You must be rolling in the money in District 20. So remember that bucket with the gap at the top. That top is fixed. I could pour, if I normally pour this much blue sand in there, then the state puts that amount of orange. If I can pour this much sand, guess who wins? The state, this part doesn't move. Then they put less sand in our bucket. So it, it, it is counterintuitive because we really, we benefit by having our AV go up. We benefit by being a desirable city. We benefit by having outstanding schools that are a destination for families all over the United States, those serving overseas, and those are wonderful things because we have students who wanna be here and we can give good programming. But in terms of the booming, does it bring a windfall of money? It does not. In fact, it benefits the state monetarily more than it does us. Does that help? Sorry, that wasn't very quick. Mr. Saul. Thank you, uh, Ms. Allen. The only thing I'm going to I'm going to take a, a little exception to one of the things that you said. Uh, the state does have the money to top off our buckets. They choose not to spend the money into education. They choose to spend it in other ways. So other than that, it's a great analogy. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Kahns? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Thank you. Okay, next, and if we can keep this short, um, 2022 CASB Annual Convention Debrief. Mr. Temby? It was good. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I it, it was good as well. I, I enjoyed it. There there were some great ones. There were some good ones. Um, so, Mr. Salt. Although I didn't have the opportunity to attend the entire conference, um, I was there as uh, the delegate assembly is. Um, we have our fall. So we had the October delegate assembly in October. 
um, and then we had the annual business meeting in December. There were two holdover resolutions. And so I'll just mention two briefly. Uh, the one was for all of the uh, the current president, the recent past president and the future president to all resign. That was withdrawn, so that was not actually a resolution that we heard. The second resolution was around uh, bylaws and having a review. Uh, it was initially brought up as far as representation for uh, CASB directors, uh, their, their board of directors and how the seats are allocated. Um, that got pushed into a much broader resolution that was an entire review of the CASB bylaws that will have a committee that will have a, um, a, a set of bylaws changes recommendations to the delegate assembly next year in October to be voted on in December. Um, the other thing that uh, we worked towards at the assembly was actually to allow remote voting. Up to this point, uh, CASB has not allowed remote voting at these delegate assemblies. And as you can imagine, uh, there are a lot of people across the state, a lot of our small rural districts that can't afford to send representatives to these um, these large assemblies that are usually around Denver. But you know, when you have people from Durango and out there, it's a substantial time and resource uh, expense for these districts to be able to come out. And so even though they're paying members of this organization, uh, their vote is essentially taken away. I mentioned previously that in October, we only had 85 of the 170 roughly um, paying members of CASB there. So we're talking about 50% um, uh, representation. Um, and that was what was setting forth the um, all of those resolutions for the, the upcoming legislative session. And so the fact that we are going to be able to move forward with remote opportunities um, for these rural districts was a real big win for the organization. Thank you. And um, we filled out a, I call it an after action report, but we don't get our per diem until we do. So um, I, I will say as of yesterday, most of us got them in and hopefully all of us will get those in uh, to um, um, Tina. <laughs> uh, I actually have shortly. something, Tom. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Cloninger. Um, because uh, I was there for all three days. I was the only board member there for all three days. Uh, no, you weren't. I was there all three days. I was there till the bitter end. No, you weren't. Yes, I you was. Weren't? I didn't see you, but I was there. I attended every single conference and I stayed you till the bitter the end. You were the last guy? Yes, I did. Oh, good yep. for you. Well, I thought he was great and I was going to say something to that. I'm so glad that you were there because that I thought and I think it actually leads into um, some of what we're talking about, both Mill Levy's books, things like that. Uh, one of the things that he talked about was how to gain trust within your district. And I and I thought that that was a really um, important thing for us to listen to. I'm gr I'm grateful. He's also the one that gave us the book. Um, and um, we were all given his book to kind of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, go, uh, anyway, that he was speaking about. My point is, I um, thought that some of the best parts of that um, convention was were the kids that I got to interact with. I went into several that were kids. Um, kid led. Did you go to the after the breakout session after him? I did. Um, so all over in the Colorado area, it was all kid led or student led, and um, it was fascinating. I thought the kids did a great job of bringing people together and having conversation, and it made me think of the fact that um, just having seats at the table, you know, D. Um, I believe it's Harrison District um, has a, a student that's on a non voting member, but a student that sits on the. Um, <clears throat> uh, on the board and just having conversation like that, we certainly get it through some of the leadership stuff that uh, Mr. Gregory has with his um, students, but um, specifically to the board. I, I just was really impressed with a lot of the things that they said, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, Ms. Cloninger. All right, let's move on. Resolution 324-22 consideration for library book appeal. 
So like the last time, we have decided to hear this appeal. So tonight we are going to decide either to keep the book or to remove the book. So we've already decided. So the first thing we're going to do is have a discussion and then based on where the discussion goes, we will have a motion either to keep or to remove. Board comments, Mr. Temby. You know, this is an important uh, discussion. Um, and so I don't think we should take it lightly. Uh, so if you'll indulge me, I have a quick statement. I would like to state again that I appreciate the parent or stakeholder in this district can question the suitability of a book for a school library. In 1968, when I was 10, I woke up on an April morning to learn Martin Luther King had been assassinated in Memphis. I also remember Robert F. Kennedy calling for calm when riots ensued in Memphis and other cities. Two months later, I had the indelible memory of my parents watching the news coverage of Robert F. Kennedy's assassination the previous night in Los Angeles after winning the California primary. In August, I watched the riots unfold at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. While pretty tuned in as a 10 year old, I didn't understand all of it at the time, but I do remember the constant protests. These were tumultuous times that carried into the mid seventies culminated by Watergate and President Nixon's resignation in 1974. During the sixties and early seventies, Americans weren't used to an esoteric asymmetrical war especially young people who are of drafting age. Protests were everywhere and seemingly daily. I'm completely opposed to how our servicemen and women were treated during and after the Vietnam War, but I do understand why peaceful protests occurred. The world was spinning and people spoke out. The author, Alexand Alexandra Styron, was born in the mid 60s. Her father, William Styron, a famous author, wrote classics like Sophie's Choice and the Confessions of Nate, Nate Turner, Nat Turner. But he also tackled in other works, hard issues like depression and suicide. He was active in the politics and controversies of the day when Alexandra was a child. One could surmise that her perspective on issues must have been influenced by the era, her parents' biases, and him wrestling with his own demons. As I read the book, I felt it was replete with the author's biases. As much as that concerned me, this concern was more than mitigated by numerous references to how kids can constructively get involved at school, in their communities, and through the legislative process. After reading the book, I then read all of the well-organized reasoning of the parent who is asking for its removal, the review panel's thoughtful notes, and Dr. Field's review of this matter on behalf of the superintendent. This book does not contain graphic sexual content or profanity that serves no purpose. It has biased statements that clearly are provocative to those who may be opposed to what she stands for. However, it has never been required reading. It is not a textbook, nor was it ever checked out of the library in the three years leading to this discussion. If the fear is indoctrination, then no child has been subjected to its content. With all that stated, I see no reason to remove this book from the Chinook Trail Middle School Library. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Ms. Cloninger? Um, I'm looking something up really quick. Can you come back to me? Yeah. Who wants to go next? Okay, Ms. Cons. So since I was uh, so sick in bed for six days last week and I didn't get to go to CASB, I had a lot of time to read and review this book and um, the reports that um, accompanied it. And as our community has seen from the last two book reviews, you know, we are, we don't take this lightly. We don't um, um, desire to remove all viewpoints from schools. Um, but that being said, this book um, was markedly different than the other two we had previously read. So um, the book refers to the audience being high school students many times, not middle school. The book glorifies stories about and sympathizes with people who are criminals who have broken the law instead of even touching on the purpose of our American laws. Even the title condones lawlessness. Um, there are a few items. Um, 
that have been proven false since the writing of this book about four years ago that at the very least need to be edited with a new edition published. Um, and those are my my kind of basics of why I'm I'm trending towards this book not being appropriate and needing to be removed from our middle school libraries. And I just wanted to um, uh, editorialize, I guess, a couple more things. Um, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm just shortening a sentence from the book that says, there are doubts and anxieties I'll never know because I'm white. The first thing I thought was false. Every single other person has doubts and anxieties you'll never know because you are not them. Remove the labels, honor and cherish and respect other unique individuals in their humanity instead of promoting the hateful ideology that white people simply existing contribute to a racist system. Does that statement help children who are born with light skin feel like they belong and are included and valued? What are all these divisive belief systems doing to the kids who aren't marginalized? They are being devalued, shunned, demonized, broken down with lack of acceptance for their innate dignity. When we want more of something in our life, we need to choose it, sustain it, then increase it. Take joy. Set a goal that you want it. Continue to observe and notice it in your life. Then be proactive about seeking and creating more joy but then take this book. Why does she want youth to seek more anger and unrest and fear? You have one book to offer to kids the best of this world and you choose this? Now tell me, is dividing the world into others, labels, victims, wrongness, subtracting from mental health issues or adding to them? That's why I do not believe it should stay in our middle school. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Ms. Collinger, are you ready? No, can you okay. give me a sec? I'm trying to find something that I'd written down. I apologize. That's okay, Mr. Salt. Thank you. So reading through this book, I was actually pretty embarrassed that this is the conversation that we're having. The author of the book did not even stick with their own premise throughout most of the book. Um, it was an interesting exercise to have someone call out inequities and racial injustice and underrepresentation, and then choose not to actually explore. At the end of each chapter, there are little vignettes and stories and interviews from individuals within each of those categories. And so when you call out specific uh, racial misrepresentations or underrepresentations, and then you choose not to actually go and pull stories from that particular race shows that you actually don't care about the things that you're writing about. So I thought that was really, again, embarrassing for the author. Um, there is a lack of a grasp of the Constitution because I've read the Constitution many times and not one time is there a constitutional right to a stable um, climate. And she calls that out as a, as a constitutional right that every student has. It's, it's not a constitutional right. And so to call that out as is, is misinformation, it's leading and it's, it's really misrepresenting these founding documents. There's another place where she calls out chemical castration as conversion therapy, but then also calls out chemical castration as gender affirming therapy. And so it's the exact same thing it's all about the way that it's labeled. And so just those are a few examples of these drastic inconsistencies that I was actually really, again, embarrassed that this is the kind of conversation that we're having to have. I'm a little surprised it's in the library at all after reading through this. So um, those are my thoughts. Ms. Kloniger, speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, that cannot happen. Um, I. I mean the hold my peace part. <laughs> um, the thing that I was looking up was um, uh, the last line of the author's um, letter that she wrote um, and was read tonight. Uh, 
And one of the things that I really appreciated about it, and I'll say it again here, it says exposure to ideas and to experiences, especially those which diverged from our own, would make us better people. It would enrich our lives and the lives of those around us because, of course, the more we understand our differences, the more we realize how much we are alike. Compassion for other people is almost always rooted in recognition of our common mirrored fra uh, frailties. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes I wonder how much violence could be avoided if we would just reach, if we could read each other's hearts in the pages of a book. I very much hope your committee will feel to do, feel as I do, that ideas are much less dangerous than the fear of them. I wanted to say one of the things I've been challenged by people about this <clears throat> and one of the things uh, that has helped me um, get to the place where I am on this matter is that when I was 18 years old I lived in China. I lived in China for a little over a year when I was young and I was in uh, a place where indoctrination and um, you know minimal information and things and to be and to you know think the way that everybody else thinks in a communist way was very much obviously the norm. I have seen what happens and I have seen that kind of stuff that has gone on. I was there a year a couple years after Tiananmen and I have seen some of the things firsthand, which I'm not going to go into tonight because it's way too late. But I will tell you, ideas are not the thing that we should be afraid of here, in my opinion. I also think that, you know, the idea that the way that I read this book was not that she was challenging people to go and be bad people or to go and and be disruptors for you know the, just for fun that wasn't what she was doing i thought she was giving good information to kids that sometimes don't have good sources for that kind of information it wasn't hugely in depth it didn't go into a, an inappropriate place in my opinion I have to say, and I am in no way trying to call out um, <clears throat> your daughter, Nicole, because I do think Grace is a fantastic person. But I think of the protest that she led outside of Rampart the year that you were um, running for the board and that you led on the steps of the board that same day. Those kind of things make a difference. And those kind of things are what we teach our kids to do, to stand up for what they believe in. I don't see the harm in that. And I don't see the harm in thinking about different things and having other people have differences of opinion. My personal thought, and I appreciate the work that the committee went into. I also read the entire book. I <clears throat> um, appreciated and I apologize um, I just wanted to say one thing that I really liked about um, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Field. <clears throat> I hope you don't mind me reading this um, about public education should seek to re be a representative of the student population in which it serves. Um, excuse me. I think that families should be encouraged to be involved in what their student reads, but choices in books that are free to read should be made on a family by family basis. I. 100% believe that and I um, appreciate the work that the um, committee went through and I personally um, thank um, the author of this book who was listening in through most of our meeting tonight um, from New York um, and I appreciated that so I just wanted to say thank you for her time. My methodology approaching these book reviews has been one of desiring to keep the book unless there are strong reasons to remove instead of a bias to remove the book unless there are reasons to keep it. I voted and the rest of the board agreed to keep in the library the previous two books, 
While I didn't like either book and thought they were biased, I felt as long as there was a book added to balance, I was okay with keeping them. The first two books had some good history in the case of We Are Not Yet Equal and had several reasonable articles in the case of the first book, How to Resist. Sadly, this book is different. From my perspective, the majority of this book is not just biased, and let me tell you, this is an incredibly biased left-wing book, but it's little more than propaganda, in my view. Even the name of the book is taken from a title, uh, the book titled Steal This Book by Abby Hoffman. Here are just a few of the examples in this book of bias, and I will say outright um, not correct. I'll be polite. Quote, the 2016 election was, as we now know, compromised by interference by Russia. End quote. Quote, human-induced climate change is the single most serious threat we face. It will ruin this beautiful planet and every person and beast on it. End quote. Quote, hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, wildfires, floods, tsunamis, earthquakes, all bad things, right? And all things that are getting more and more common around the world because global warming is causing more extreme weather. End quote. Pray tell, how is global warming causing more earthquakes and tsunamis? Quote, nuclear power is often promoted as a clean and cost-effective form of energy, but it's also super risky, end quote. What? Nuclear is one of the most safest forms of energy on the planet. Quote, what can we do in school? Shoot a video that inspires or downright scares your peers into doing what's right, end quote. Quote, and while many other large countries have been notorious environmental offenders, a disproportionate amount of the junk we breathe is produced right here at home, end quote. No talk of how much cleaner the, our air is now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. I used to drive in to Denver um, in the late 70s, and it was nothing but a cloud. It was, it was so dirty. Flying into LA 25 years ago, it was horrible. It's, we are so much better off than we were. Uh, nor the fact that we have reduced our CO2 emissions more than most countries because we have been replacing coal with natural gas. Um, here's a, from an interview with Sh Shalene Woodley. She's an actress. Quote, there are thousands of privileges that add to my daily comfort and existence because I am white. I, as a white individual, am simply by existing, contributing to a system that is racist, oppressive, and manipulated to keep it that way. I find that a very offensive quote. Um, in the immigration chapter, there was not a single word spoken about the difference between legal and illegal immigration. Next one, quote, recognize the ways in which you benefit from systems of oppression, end quote. Next one, quote, we cannot guilt young people about voting without being honest about the many mechanisms in our system that are designed to keep power in the hands of straight, rich, white men, end quote. I find that outrageous. Arg, my insert name of loved one here, voted for Trump. You wonder how anyone you know and love could possibly have voted for someone you consider to be unacceptable. This book is advocating for young people to get involved. The first book that we reviewed, um, basically it was the exact same thesis. It did the same thing. So this book, in my view, is redundant. Um, if you want your child to, to know how to get involved in, in, in liberal politics, that book is available. We let them keep it. This book offers nothing to the library. Its subject matter is redundant. Um, are there parts of this book that are not offensive? Sure, a few, but frankly, not many. There is zero documentation for the assertions made, and many of them are outright wrong. Let me say this. I am not opposed to students finding areas they are passionate about and give them tools to help them be better citizens, but let's do it in a somewhat balanced way. The problem, the problems this book addresses are mostly from a left-wing perspective. How about the problems of open borders, runaway government spending, protection of the unborn, where we get the rare earth metals that are necessary for batteries, etc. Don't our kids have a right to be involved in no struggles too? I think this book should be removed not because of its viewpoint. That is wrong and likely illegal. I believe this book should be removed because it is propaganda. It is attempting to not help kids to think for themselves, not teaching them how to think, but this is, book is clearly telling them loudly and clearly what to think. And that's exactly what we don't wanna do. There is no option in this book for anything but a hard left viewpoint. We are giving implicit endorsement of this sort of fringe belief system. This is wrong and should not be a part of our great district. If Proud Boys or another hard right group had a book like this, I would oppose it also. In my view, there is no viable educational purpose for a middle school student to read this. And the, the notion of, of ideas being expressed, 
absolutely. Let's express all of our ideas. This book, again, all the quotes that I read that are just simply biased, incorrect. Um, I, I, I just, I was, this, this book is different. And, and I just, that's, those are my comments. So. Can I just add one thing? You may. I appreciate that you believe that these are biased and, and leftist and all of that. But again, that is your opinion. And just because you say it doesn't mean it's fact either. So I'm just saying we could argue the individual issues all night long, and they have been on every single news channel, media, any kind of newspaper, whatever you believe in, they've been argued. But this kind of information to me is not dangerous to a child who is wanting to just know. And I feel like the idea of going down the route of ban banning any books is by and large opening up Pandora's box. That's, That's my humble opinion. opinion. Yep, and I disagree with that. There is a place for, uh, there is a reason why we have this policy. There was a book that was removed five years ago, and it was a 5-0 vote on the board. So that this idea that we can never get rid of a book that's not a, that's not appropriate, I, I disagree with. In my view, this book should not be in a middle school library. There's too many statements that are offensive, that are wrong, that are, in my view, racist, and, and I uh, that, that's my view. So any other Mom, comments? That book, that book, because I read that one five years ago as well, and that book was inappropriate for the age that it was in that, in, you know, in the middle school, in my opinion. But the thing is, is you talk about this being one of the issues is that it's redundant to the first and second book. I mean, I mean there's no, so I said only books. redundant to the first book. OK, fine. But there even still, there's plenty of books that talk about the same thing in, in the library. There's thousands of books. So I, I, I just we're not going to agree on that. I get that. But I just think that we enter into a very um, precarious place of um, being in a place where we open Pandora's box for other reasons that could be, I think, far more silly to come up and ban things. Well, and I think it's uh, and I, I think it's concerning if we simply say, look, we're just going to let anything go. I think that's just as concerning. So um, any other comments, Mr. Temby? Well, I think we're being pretty presumptive here. Um, I have five kids um, and my kids are pretty discerning. They've got a good frame of reference. They've been raised well. They've had parents involved in their education all the way along. Kids are smart and kids will distill from anything they read what is hyperbole, what is outrageous, what is illuminating, um, synthesize it, and then figure out where they stand. And it's pretty presumptuous of a bunch of adults who aren't reading the book, you know, with that lens uh, to assume the impact that's going to have on a kid. I look for age appropriateness, particularly with a graphic sexual content. I look at it from profanity that has no place. And is that appropriate for middle school? You bet it's not. But ideas, ideas that offend us, that aren't supported by tremendous data, our libraries are replete with books that if you start picking at the scab, you're going to find full of bias, full of horseshit, whatever. We've just selected these and we're making a determination out of 9,000 books in a library, what's appropriate or not? Where does it end? It's starting now, but where does it end? Because we're offended, because it doesn't meet our ideology or we think it's outrageous, is our problem. Okay, well, we don't need comments from the, from the gallery here. <laughs> but this is a dangerous precedent, and again, is it a great book? No, it's not. It is, is it the most outrageous thing we've ever read or seen? No, it's not. And I think we have to be very careful about the water in which we're treading right now.
Lord, Mr. Salt. Thank you. I want to be very clear that the content matter, the, the ideas espoused in this, were not why I said this is a garbage book. It's how the author approached it, what they talked about. It is, it is a really bad application of ideas. The ideas themselves, I, I, I really couldn't care less about, to be pretty frank. It's the fact that the author, it was clear they did not do the homework that they needed. It was clear that they, they could not hold to their own precautions, to their own um, convictions. Had nothing to do with the ideas themselves. Ms. Cons. And I just want to echo what Mr. Salt said and repeat what I said that I editorialized a few of the things that I just didn't think were healthy for our children here, but irrelevant for removing or retaining a book. I just was giving my comments that I didn't think it was healthy, but this book bills itself as objective and scholastic, but it has false information that needs to be corrected. Number one reason why it shouldn't be in a school. And, a, Notice, and oops, sorry. And then sorry, I um, thought you were done. Oh, it's okay. And then um, just again, that she, um, the author mentions uh, a high school audience. So again, we are reviewing it for a middle school. The author herself seems to state that it's it's not geared for that um, population. So those are the the official reasons. I understand not not agreeing with um, with with views and bias. You know, I want any book published in America to be available in some place in America for whoever needs to reference it. But uh, we're reviewing it being in a middle school and there's uh, legitimate reasons why it doesn't belong there. Any other comments? I would just say um, if any of you have copies of this book that you no longer want, I would be happy to take it. All right. I think we're going to go with the second one. We need a motion to overturn the decision of the superintendent's designee to support the decision of the book challenge committee for the book Steal This Country in the Chinook Trail Middle School Library. The book will be removed from the library. Do we have a motion? I would like to ask uh, more of a going back to discussion briefly. Um, OK, then we'll we don't have a motion yet, so we'll just continue. This Correct. Case. So. In regards to motions that we have coming up, we have multiple options. I'm curious what. The rest of you believe would be appropriate action. On this, removing it to where it is no longer available is one thing. Moving it to another level of school is something different. Moving it to a public library where it still has full access to anyone who would like to check that out. There are different ways that we can handle this and still make it available to students who are interested in doing that. That's not at a middle school level. I'm curious what people think about. That type of course of action. Can I sorry, I, I know that I'm jumping in and I don't mean to. It's because I can't really tell when you guys are stopping. Um, <laughs> I believe that it's already at the public library. It's certainly at any local bookstore. Um, so those are things that are already taken care of. And um, since we are just talking about Chinook Trail Middle School, um, I personally was under the impression that ideas and um, and that kind of thing, differences of opinions are are something that we can all have. We've all said that we appreciate differences of opinions and and all of that. The one thing that you all have said, and I'm speaking, Aaron, I've heard it mostly from Nicole and from Tom, is that unless it's a sexual nature, you don't have there's there's no reason to pull the book. And so I don't understand if this is just an ideological issue 
why this book needs to be pulled because that's not a sexual book. It's uh, go ahead, Mr. Temby. I think this begs a, a bigger question, which is, and again, our, our staffs are thin, but when books haven't been checked out at all over an extended period, I think that requires a review of the staff to see what's not being checked out. This book by the year and by its visceral tone written in 2016 has lived a lot of its life in terms of comments, particularly about the election, uh, the author's feeling about that election. Um, so it is becoming less relevant over time. An important discriminator for all of us is we're surmising the negative effect it's gonna have on kids. Well, it's never been checked out. It has never been checked out. So if the fear of indoctrination, of social emotional harm coming from this book, it hasn't happened. It is not required reading. It is not a textbook. It is a passive resource to be sought out by somebody who maybe wants to get a different opinion, a broadened view of how people think about things. So this has not poisoned the well of D20 in any way, shape or form. It has offensive stuff. It has stuff that is not supported by fact, but by opinion. And again, I would submit that our libraries are replete with books like this, works of fiction and nonfiction. So where does this stop? So yeah, we can, we can take it out. For what purpose right now? It's, it, it hasn't been checked out. Are we waiting for some sort of bomb to explode once it's taken out? And our kids are gonna be on this uh, downward spiral because of this book. It, it, it's not happening, it hasn't happened. But it does beg the question, should our librarians be looking at the books that are not being checked out for extended periods of time and determine their relevance and do we clutter our shelves with stuff that's not being checked out and make sure we have more relevant tomes in each of our libraries? To me, that's the bigger question, which is, are our, are our libraries serving our populations? Right now, the books we're talking about have barely been checked out, the, the first three. And again, I love the fact that we can have these conversations and talk about the suitability of books but we're not talking about a tsunami of checkouts where kids have been indoctrinated by, by this missive. And I just, I, I don't know. I, just, I think we're on a very slippery slope as both a board and a district when we start going there and supposing how kids are gonna interpret this book. Again, I don't think it's not age appropriate. Is it? not well researched? Is it not well supported? Is it disjointed? Yeah, you can make a lot of cases. But all my concerns about the bias were mitigated by good constructive ways in which kids can get engaged. So I, I think we have an obligation to really think through what we're doing here. But the bigger question as we review these book policies, uh, how to put books into our libraries as part of a more holistic view and approach to this, uh, has to be how many times are the books being checked out? And if they just aren't being checked out, maybe it's time for them to be shelved and replace them with more contemporary works. I just, you know, uh, as a parent, if, if my kid was given a research project, brought that home, I'd be having a discussion with them. It's like, what do you think? And they, you know, and I have a lot of faith my kids would discern what was the, pardon my French, the horseshit in the book and what was constructive. But again, that's me, but I'm a parent just like you guys, so. Mr. Salt. I would like to address Ms. Cloninger's comments. Uh, I haven't, you haven't heard me say that because I haven't said that those are the only criteria that I would use to, to kick out a book. Um, I just want to throw that out there that there are That's lots of reasons. Yeah, Nicole and Tom. I just wanted to 
to be clear. Um, I, I tend to agree with Mr. Timby over here that if we have books that have not been checked out, then we should look at a policy that would have uh, a refresh of that. Um, you know, I, I would throw out that since this has not been checked out, is there harm in having a different book take its place, whether that is by board action, whether that is by librarian action? If it's not been checked out, it is many years old, outdated information, and frankly, lots of bad information, that I think having a policy of that nature to enforce uh, a refresh of library resources to stay current with times might be an appropriate action. I would posit that this book would be a, a key uh, starting point uh, from our librarians under any such policy um, because it has been checked out zero times and is riddled with bad information. What if we what if we did something like we said to replace the book, let the librarian replace the book with a more contemporary book? Would, would that would that be reasonable? I my only that, that my only comment. On, excuse me, Heather. Let me just finish the thought. Um, but again, we're singling out this book. What I'm making a statement about is we would look at a list. I'm sure we can generate it of books that are just not being checked out. And so that would constitute a review of all of them, regardless of title, topic, content, etc. I'm not in favor of a a discriminatory policy towards this book being replaced. Well, I'm not advocating uh, yeah. a policy. I'm just saying tonight we got this one book. I agree with you, and I, I thought about this with this book. It's like, and I'm not criticizing the, the librarian at all, but I, I'm thinking to myself, if a book hasn't been checked out in three years, why are we even keeping it? And so perhaps if we just made a statement and said, look, let's replace this book. And, and then I, I know that part of this whole process of, of books and everything else is going to be is going to be relooked at. We could encourage that. We don't need to say that, but I think I think the district would agree that that is something that we ought to consider is is yeah. When, and like I say, I, I could care less what type of book it is. If a book hasn't been checked out in three years. Perhaps that that ought to be a, a look a look see. So maybe this maybe that's a middle ground. We can we can just direct the librarian to replace this book with with a, a similar book. I'm 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 okay with a similar political bias uh, that that is that is more up to date that that is perhaps in my view more accurate. Uh, does anybody have an appetite for that? I'm j I'm just against the principle of it being this book. Can well, we again, also, but we have this oh, book. Oh. The, the, tonight is this book. I, I, I hear you. I, I hear you. We're only looking at this book, though. That's the challenge, right? Could we also, we also reach out to the, the um, author and see if she has something else? I don't really have an appetite for that, personally. Well, but my point is, is that I don't. I mean. I don't get what you're trying to do with this one book. You're trying to replace it with trying something to find a middle ground. Equally, what I'm trying to do. I understand that, but I'm just saying like, where does it end? And to that point of what Will was saying, where does it end? You, you I, I don't understand the fact that it hasn't been checked out for three years. Fine. I bet there's a lot of books that haven't been checked out for three years. I have books on my shelf that I haven't read in three years, but I still love them and I don't want to throw them away. I don't think that that's the cut off. I'm saying I think that we need to have more um, of a discussion about why we are trying to eliminate this book versus, I mean, we're making up, I, I and I'm, I'm kind of speaking off the cuff here with, I've worked in libraries with my previous job. I know the work that it goes to these librarians that we're kind of, you know, just guessing, oh, maybe we could have them do this, that, or the other about their job that's a lot there, there's a lot of kind of what we're throwing out that could create a lot more work for them i'm just saying to come to a middle ground how are we how are we coming to the middle ground without having that information you know because i don't want to be making more work for our librarians so that we can come to a middle ground here i does that even make sense well, I, I, I understand that may be more work for a librarian, and I, I apologize for doing that, but these 
these book reviews have been a ton of extra um, work for them. And so I'm like I say, I'm trying to find a middle ground here. OK, I, I agree. I, and I just don't I, think that we need to be giving them more because they have been doing well, a lot of work. Give me a middle ground, Heather. Well, I think that we've kind of talked about it with the fact that there are books that are in that library that have information that would be pro right, you know, thought like the stuff that you're saying. I personally, I mean, like we're not getting into the politics of things. We shouldn't. But do we want our kids to be in a civics class and to be in a AP Gov class and things and just talk about the the fluff and the and the thing that's going to make everybody not uncomfortable we want them to be making those kind of conversations we want to be raising these critical thinkers and i feel like we're kind of pussyfooting around trying to make it so that everybody feels okay when it really needs to be that there can be controversial things that you don't agree with that there are tsunamis and things that are happening more and more and they could be because of climate change and they could be human caused and that's somebody's opinion and I just don't see where we're going to get to the point where we say, OK, tit for tat. I don't. I'm not trying to be unreasonable. I just don't understand how to get there with this on the table of just take it in, you know, keep it or not. My recommendation, and again, it's my middle ground, so I'll leave it at this. Um, I support keeping the book in the library but holistically looking at our policy uh, for every library, not just Chinook Trail, but looking at books that are just not either uh, relevant still, um, and again, that would be a hard one, but the books that just aren't being checked out for extended periods, I think they're almost wasting space. You know, to have something that's just so marginal uh, out there waiting to be uh, checked out, which may be this book. Um, and again, it was written at a very emotional time six years ago. Uh, it's less relevant today. It's probably less of a resource today for anybody. So I think we should be as part of a holistic look at our policy around books and introducing books to our libraries. Um, this may be a casualty of that, and I am perfectly fine with that. I am 100% behind that, um, but I'm not in favor of making this book the first example there um, and pulling it from the library. I just don't see the merit in it just because we don't like it. We don't like its construct, some of the claims in it. I can guarantee you if we had the time to ferret through a library at any middle school or high school, we'd be offended or concerned about a lot of books in terms of their construct, in terms of their assumptions, the bias include, included in almost every book. If you really dig into most books, you're gonna find a bias. Yeah, there's a difference between a bias. And, and again, this book was just different over the top from the other ones. What if we what if we said, we'll, we'll keep the book, but you have to get parental approval to check it out? Is that outrageous? Is that is that unreasonable? That exists. That already uh, happens. I, I don't. Tell me how. With that, y, with that YA um, sticker that's on the label or on the back. Well, also a parent, you know, a parent, if they're really concerned about a, a book and has identified a book. Well, that's different. As our, let me finish, as our parent has, um, they would probably invoke the ability to say, I do not want my child checking out this book. That exists. Well, I think we're confusing opt-in versus opt-out, right? One, one is all books are available unless you tell me, Mr. and Mrs. Parent, that you don't want this book. That's different than saying, OK, if you want to check out this book, you need to just say it's OK. And that's different. And I, I think that I would be fine with that. Keep the book. And if, if somebody wants to check it out, you just need to get your parents a nod from your parents. I'm fine with that because now the parents know I have no problem. Just like any parent can check it out. Is, is that is that unreasonable? I guess I don't understand the difference between your buy-in and buy-out. Oh, huge, okay, huge difference. One is, unless you specifically say, as a parent, there's 9,000 books in the library. There's no way for a parent to say, uh, unless they go in and literally look at all these books, okay, I don't want my child to have this book or this book or this book. Th that, that's, 
that, that just doesn't happen. Um, right. basically. So I, I've always thought that was a straw man when I hear people say, well, a parent can say they don't want this, my child to have this book. No. The other option is, okay, if you want your child to check out this book, just send us a note and we'll let you check it out. Can I just say, Tom, in my recollection of the previous book that was banned five years ago, was that that parent found that book under the mattress yep. of their child. And Correct. so there is some issue here with how that works and I, I just feel like isn't that what we're already saying by putting that YA label on it and then saying if you want your child in middle school to check out a book with that on it then that's part of that right I am I missing that totally I yeah, have you, been I just having disagree a lot with you that that's all young adult books and I I, I again I, I I think that is very different than what we're talking about I, like I say that that's Board, what the rest of y'all, what do you think? Go ahead, Mr. Salt. So could Ms. Cloninger, could you explain the young adult label for me? Sure. My understanding is that there are certain books that are of whatever nature that um, come through the um, libraries that's that have you know have that type that have that um label or whatever they're in that genre um and at least i i specifically know the ones in challenger because that's the book um that i was referencing um but or that i worked on sorry um years ago uh they had a section where they were all like those titles. They were all the YA titles. They had like the little sticker. And I recognize that the person who's um, not, who's upset with these books and has brought this to our, um, our awareness has said that they don't believe that there were YA label on either this book or another one. Um, that can easily be fixed by just making sure that it's in that category. Um, but my understanding was that they had a section where that already had to happen, that you already had to have permission to go and check out anything out of that YA section. It wasn't just that a young adult book is called YA. It was under a certain category of like, like depth, depth or whatever. Okay, so at the last meeting when we heard the the challenge on the second book i asked about the young adult label what i was told at that point was it was an age restriction um and so as long as student a was and i don't remember what it was if it was 12 years 13. old or 13 um, as I long as they were 13 years old they were able to check out the young adult material what I hear you saying right now is that young adult material is restricted unless they are approved, that material is approved by parents. So I, I'm, I still unclear, I'm still Sorry. unclear on what the young adult label is, is, and I don't know if Mr. Gregory, Dr. Fields, if someone here has some insight on exactly, exactly sure. what that policy is. I'm trying to pull up Chinook Trail Middle School's library uh, because the the librarian there, Tracy, does a really nice job communicating with families at the beginning of the school year about young adult labels. So my understanding, and Shelly might be able to help me a little bit too, is that young adult labels are um, put on books that are approved for students ages or, or reading level or interest level age 14 and up. That's why it gets a young adult label. We don't have a policy that says you have to be a certain age to check out a YA book. But a parent can say, um, I don't want my child checking out any YA books. That's but that's that different, works. but that's different than parental approval. That's the thing. That that's the opt-in versus out opt-out difference. And that's a huge fundamental difference. So I let's see if I can because it, it comes to the same result but through a different mechanism. Uh, an an opt-in option would say nothing is available at all 
except for the things that I choose. An opt out option or methodology would say everything's available except for the things that I choose. As far as I'm concerned, as long as there is a label attached and a mechanism that parents can say, I don't want my kids to have this at a broader level, it's not title focused. Because I agree, 9,000 books is untenable and really unreasonable to say, just tell me the titles that you don't want. Because I don't even know what titles would be in there. Um, even when it's all available, trying to scroll through 9,000 books would be difficult. So if we have these broad categorical options to opt in or opt out of, I think that meets most of what I need because that gives the parents a control at a broader level to be able to do that. I totally agree. We don't have that right now. That's the problem. And I'm not so sure we as a board should start directing admin to create policy like that, but go ahead. I was going to say, I believe if I understood Dr. Fields correctly and <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going, it's way past my bedtime. If I understand this correctly, is that there is an option through, uh, is it Infinite Campus or whatever, where they can go through and, and say, I do not want my kids to be able to have young adult novel or young adult materials. I, I don't want to speak out of knowing what I, I don't want to sound like I know exactly what I'm talking about here, but I visited the library at Chinook Child Middle School the other day to check labels and just you know, be a bit more comfortable with, with that specific library. I also went on to the website, which is maybe where Dr. Field is headed now is, and when I played around with it, now I didn't test it, right? Uh, I remember uh, being able to select uh, YA, right, young adult. I believe it was also by author. Uh, I had the option um, in the drop downs to deselect, I guess, I don't know which, what's the right word to use, but choose an author, restrict it, an author. Um, I don't remember if there was one, like there was a subject matter kind of, I think that would be a tough one. Um, but there's there's organizations out there that classify all these books, right? By age and just like the movies get rated, there's there's all of that exists. But what I'm telling you, I guess, is I, I, I'm pretty confident there's a way to go into the system and put in broader restrictions than just one single title. Although you can, um, I believe there's broader restrictions because I played with it the other day. Now, again, I didn't go back to the school and test it. Right, to see what would happen if I tried to check something out. Um, but I believe those are already in place. Dr. Mm -hmm. Field, do you? Yeah, uh, yeah. so if, if I may, um, I'm on the Chinook Trail Middle School website now, and it, uh, Ms. Schneider gives a little um, explanation about young adult fiction. She says, middle school by its very nature is a time when children grow and mature by leaps and bounds. And each child is unique in how they change throughout these years. With that in mind, we try to provide reading choices in the library that are suitable and interesting to 11 year olds, as well as ones that are appropriate and engaging for 14 year olds, almost ready for high school. Unlike movies, books do not have ratings, but we have a system at Chinook Trail Middle School that we use to indicate our more mature books. We place a YA or young adult sticker on any book that based on published professional reviews is more appropriate for grades eight and up or ages 14 and up. These books often contain more mature content. Our policy is that any student may check out any book in our library. We have carefully curated a collection that includes a wide selection of reading materials along with student and teacher favorites. Our hope is that students can see themselves as well as the world around them through books of all kinds. We tell all incoming sixth grade students that they should use their best judgment and consider their parents' expectations when selecting reading material. Ms. Cons. Um, This is an aside, but Dr. Field, do you, she said young adult fiction. Do you think she also means nonfiction? Oh yeah. Okay, I just. I, I mean, it was, she, she has, the books, some of the books that we've been reviewing, okay. I'll have a sticker. It was just noticeable because of what I'm about 
just to reiterate. Um, I think it's evident from everyone or to everyone listening that, um, you know, from the first two books we reviewed, we are not taking this lightly and we don't support a blanket just getting rid of books. Um, and especially due to ideology, it's a slippery slope none of us want to go down. Um, and so, uh, Uh, you know, something that was addressed about, you know, us saying that we probably would only vote to remove a book if it was sexually explicit. I didn't know I would come across a nonfiction book with such falsities in it that, I mean, we are an educational institution. There are things that should not be falsified given to our students. That's, that's the crux of the matter to me. It's not ideology as evident by keeping the first two books in that we all chose to do. Um, you know, to Mr. Timby's um, comments, how long are we gonna do this? Whenever we're called to do so by board policy. You know, it's, it's, I understand your sentiment. None of us, you know, perhaps we don't wanna be going through this rigmarole constantly, but it's our job. And so I, I think that's kind of an, an irrelevant point that, I don't know. We're called to do this. And then, but then secondly, that it's not been checked out. I also think that's an irrelevant point to, to what we're discussing about going through books. That's another issue, but it's the principle of the matter yeah, when the books. Cons were, I, I couldn't disagree more. Okay. About the checking out. Um, a couple of things. Yeah. Um, Mr. Lavalley, I do think as a board, we've got a responsibility to highlight the fact that we're sitting here as a board at this level talking about this issue. I think we can also dispense our thoughts about maybe policy changes or whatever and allow administration to administrate that. Um, in terms of the book, um, I stand by everything I said. You know, where does it stop? This is a book that has ideas, it has biases, all that. I go back to the point where there are 9,000 books in the library. If we all scatter and hit the shelves, we're going to find other books that were say, whoa, whoa, geez, that's not as well researched as it could have been or whatever. So the point is, where does it end, right? For me, again, age appropriateness doesn't necessarily involve ideas for a young adult book. It does when it gets into graphic sexual content. Again, profanity that has no use, no meaning, no redeeming qualities. That's where I think we step in as a board. But when the ideas expressed or espoused are questionable, all that, yeah, we can pick pick apart this book, but again, multiply it many times over. And I do think the fact that it hasn't been checked out is massively relevant. Again, you know, what is the fear? What is the fear of these things? I just don't get it, right? It has not been checked out. It is not required reading. It is not a textbook. It has not indoctrinate, indoctrinated our our poor little kids who might feel guilty about something. It, it hasn't happened. So let's look at the life of a book. If it hasn't been checked out, that's the bigger issue. But, but again, where does it end, right? If a book on the merits of it being a piece of trash comes to us, then like we did as a board a number of years ago, we yanked it. But this one, to me, doesn't rise to that level. I, I was bothered by some of the comments in it. But again, mitigated by the tone of how do you get involved? And I read it too. And I reread a couple areas just to make sure I wasn't crazy. But again, <laughs> just holistically as a board, 
we need to help administration give a thumbs up to a, a, a real deep review uh, of how we look at our books, how we gentrify our libraries over time to make sure that they stay relevant and not just static because that's the original library set that they got when they opened four or five years ago. They need to remain relevant and the books that are not getting checked out to me are not relevant. They haven't been a resource. They haven't poisoned the well, if you will. Um, so let's look at this holistically. But to make a example of this book is unfairly looking at one book out of 9,000 and making a statement about it. Because if you do yank it because it's the first one, it's the precedent setting book, you've made a statement about that book. And I, I'm totally opposed to that. So, so, so let's 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 compromise here. And, and I know this. Let's say that the book stays and if a parent gives permission, they can check it out. I know that's unusual. That's odd, but it's a compromise. Can we do that and get out of here? So I think the important thing to, to note with that is that what I understand you saying is that we would effectively say no one would be allowed to check out young adult novels or this no, book or whatever just this book for now this book for because now. That, i think that's creating policy which i don't want to do just again this is a this is a compromise this is a band-aid this is not a long-term solution we, we go back to admin and say okay we we discovered an issue so we need to figure out a way to fix it um let them come up with that because that's what admin does but for now we'll say the book stays and if parents give permission to check the book out they can check it out it's one book and, and it's a compromise and we can leave. And I, I'm okay with that because we're getting parental approval to, to, to check that out. Well, I'm seeing you nod. I'm fine with that. Are you guys okay with that? I'm fine with that. All right, Ms. Cloninger, Heather. I'm at home, so I'm comfortable. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I am comfortable with that, Tom. All right, I'm trying to work. We're trying to, to come up with a, a good solution. Okay, so I'm gonna propose that I'm going to say this. We need a motion to approve allowing the book to stay in the Chinook Trail Library, but it can only be checked out with parental approval. Is that good? So move with the caveat that it is an interim solution to agree. Sure. Agreed. Yeah. So moved. Second. Tina, did you have something? I know. So, say, what did I what did I say? Well, it's recorded. It is recorded. Right, but I want, but the sentence isn't really a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a math guy. Sorry. I just need it to be. We need a motion. A motion to resolve, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, do you have the the resolution there? I can I can amend it on the fly and read it off. So you're affirming the decision. Well, again, okay. The so we need a motion to affirm the decision of the superintendent's designee to support the decision of the book channel. The book stays in the library. Okay, this is fair. But, then but on, the book stays in the library, but can only be checked out with parental approval. But can only be checked out with parental approval. Uh, or the board directs the superintendent to add or identify, but uh, no, yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk about the second part. The board directs the superintendent to add or identify a book to said library that offers an alternative or different perspective. Do we want to say that as well? We have said that on the first two. Not if we're just putting a band aid on this one. I feel like, yeah, obviously policy needs to be looked at. Yeah, and we do have the issue about there is a policy about how to introduce books into the library. I want to make sure that we're conforming to that. So as a Band-Aid, let's go with the first part of that. Um, I think there was a comment about you know, what constitutes and how, what's the mechanism for the parent approval. Um, Dr. Field, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, the mechanics of a parental approval at the Chinook Trail Middle School for this book to be checked out. Um, obviously, it would require for this particular book a flagging. 
of some sort? Do you think we can work through that mechanism? Yes, I think that from what my understanding is from our district level um, librarians here is that it's actually very easy to do. Okay. And okay. do we say in the interim until policies changed? I mean, what do we, how do we end that period? I guess my feeling is informally, I think we have spoken loud and clear of the need to adjust this policy. Um, and I think admin hears that. And I think that is something that they intend to do. And I'm comfortable with that just simply informally. We don't have to necessarily say that, tell them or direct them. Okay. I agree, Tom. Okay. So we need to, so we need a motion to affirm the decision of the superintendent's designee to support the decision of the book challenge committee for the book Steal This Country in the Chinook Trail Middle School Library. The book stays in the library, but can only be checked out with parental approval. And then is everybody okay? I guess I, I'm not crazy about it, but not doing the second part of identifying a separate book. Yeah, I think that's a bigger issue for us to tackle through administration, which is we need to look at the, um, the gentrification of libraries, how the policy works, and then also the introduction of new, new volumes into our libraries. All right, I guess I'm okay. You, what do you guys, do you have an opinion about that second part? Mr. Gregory, are you okay with that? Only if it requires parental approval to match the... I know, that's what I was thinking. So I'm okay with just deleting that second part for, for this book. Okay, that's the motion. Tina, did you get it? All right. Okay. Well, did we have a motion and a second? So moved, as written. Okay. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mrs. Cons, Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Okay, we actually got a, a unanimous. I didn't think that would happen. All right, happy birthday, Dr. Susan Field, December 11th. And Dr. Jim Smith, December 18th. All right, question number six from the CASB self-assessment. Did the board focus on its word policy guidance goals and not operations. We got close, but we, we stepped back, I think. Does is, is anybody else have any comment on that? All right, was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level, and upon graduation, will be fully prepared for success? This meeting is finally adjourned. <laughs>